Yeah. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Odisha State of Talmic Society, I have the great pleasure to invite you for this uh, Oklatroma webinar. Uh, today, 26 July in India and some parts of the world, we are having a uh, 25th uh, July. Uh, that is Dr. Wendy here. And I request Dr. Das, Dr. Patnaik, and Dr. Subudhi to do the introduction about the Odisha State of Talmic Society. Dr. Patnaik? Yes. Yeah, please. Good, mo good morning and good evening also depends upon the place where you are, sir. And it is a pleasure, it is our pleasure to invite all of you on behalf of the Odisha State Ophthalmological Society to this international webinar on ocular trauma. And I think with our interaction amongst ourselves, it will be of a nice experience and we will learn many things from each other. So with these few notes, now I request uh, Professor Subuddhi to give an introduction. No, Dr. Natarajan will say something. Dr. Natarajan, please continue. Uh, yes. Okay. So, uh, we shall, shall we start the session with uh, introducing Dr. Uh, Wendy? Yes. No, no. I, I will say something. I will. I will okay. I will, yeah, I will, yeah, definitely. That's why we want you to do that. Yeah, I will give the introduction. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, good morning, everybody. I welcome you all to this webinar on ocular trauma organized by Odisha State Open Society. However, this is the masterpiece of Professor Padmasri Dr. Natarajan. I call him my guru because he's the teacher of teachers. So anything possible today because of him only. He took short time to prepare the all speakers, international speakers, national speakers, and also state speakers also. I'm very happy it's going to happen today. There's a, a very good interaction between the international speakers and national speakers today in the uh, platform of Kletrava. So, yeah. as you know, the blindness, when it's a bilateral, it is a serious public health hazard. And it affects the person's quality of life and socioeconomic uh, and the psychological status of the patient and his family members and in the society as large. About half a million people become blind from ocular trauma. And about 35 to 40 percent of monocular blindness is due to ocular trauma, and more so in children. The most common cause of blindness in pediatric group age group is the ocular trauma because probably lack of parents' supervision and <coughs> family care, care people. So uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you consider the epidemiology of the eye injuries, in all over the world, it varies from place to place. However, there are some factors which are very common. They are the uh, lifestyle, socioeconomic status, traffic status of the people, the sports and lot of activities. And whatever the injuries, even the minor patient, his family members, and the society, because they lost time loss from the work, and uh, uh, schools, and also expensive hospitalization, prolonged uh, treatment, prolonged follow-up, and ultimately maybe visual handicap later. So the major risk factors would have seen that the four factors, mostly age, gender, socioeconomic status, and the lifestyle. It's very commonly seen in the young age group between 18 to 25 years. Later, or sometimes assaults, and major is the road traffic accidents. The minor injuries like war injuries, gunshot injuries, and sometimes firework injuries are also very common. Even in our country, in the developing country like ours, a small injury to the cornea get infected the fungus, given as to fungal corneal ulcer, non ulcer, fungal corneal ulcer, which leads to ultimately uh, loss of the eye in spite of all modern medical and surgical treatment. Most cases of these traumatic injuries are preventable, but however, we don't take care. The best example I would like to say that in COVID, you know, to prevent transmission of this COVID-19, everybody is uh, advised to use the face mask and the face shields. But how many of us are utilizing this? Because many times we feel inconvenient to use them, and we are not aware of that this can prevent the COVID. Similarly, you know, at workplaces, even a lot of protective measures are advised and then given supplied also, the people do not use them, causing the, all these accidents. The best is also helmet. 
well by, by in our country um, bicycle i mean scooters and the bicycle uh, motor motor vehicles they do not use properly the uh, helmets and the seat belts resulting lot of traffic accidents so today is a great opportunity for us to interact with the international guest speakers with our national speakers and our state people also to come with a consensus come with this uh, sop to plan for the prevention and measurement of this major ocular trauma leading to blindness so with these few words i welcome you all again to give a interactive whole day day long webinar with this ocular trauma so thank you very much so now i uh, over to yeah. dr nirajan to introduce and start the uh, webinar thank you dr subhadi and thanks to orissa state ophthalmic society for giving me the opportunity to organize it and uh, my love for ocular managing ocular trauma and i think one is managing second is we want to prevent and with this i am sharing my screen to introduce my our first speaker so you can see my screen so to welcome to the international portfolio of ophthalmic trauma orissa state of uh, ophthalmology society and we have the first speaker dr wendy rice uh, maldonado dr wendy rice uh, uh, has been the head of the ophthalmology of the national ophthalmology unit of putamela since 2009 and uh, as a and uh, 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 and as a professional she focuses on providing comprehensive ophthalmological care with special emphasis on cases of eye trauma in children and adults in this area she has performed complex surgeries and has successfully followed up ophthalmic patients in complex medical and surgical areas both at the ocular and systemic levels and these clinical challenges ranging from preserving the integrity of eyeball to improving visual acuity have increased professional experience in their specialty area it specializes in fast handling largely determines the final visual prognosis of the patient and to date dr a has organized annual ocular trauma symposium in gotamella for several years at the same time she has participated as a lecturer and has been invited as a member of the expert panels at the various national and international ophthalmology congresses so i am happy that we have professor wendy rain uh, here today so i'll stop sharing my screen and i request you to share your screen and start your presentation okay thank you very much there in good night here in Guatemala. I'm uh, Dr. Wendy Reyes and I would like to present different cases of orbitocranial trauma. The important thing in this type of trauma is having a coordinated and multidisciplinary case management with different specialists like otorhinolaryngology, neurosurgery, maxillofacial and plastic surgery. There are injuries that only affect the orbit and the annexa, but other walls affect the sinus or the intracranial content. Begin this is the one that we will focus the most, as that will affect other facial areas. So the first case is of a five-year-old patient who showed up 15 days after the trauma when falling from a tree and having a tree branch penetrating in the patient eye. One of the relatives reported that a piece of this branch was removed by them. Using a tomography, a foraging body was observing in the coronal and axial section that crossed the orbit and affecting the encephalic tissue and forming a cerebral abscess and a non-communicating hydrocephalus. And after a performing an orbital exploration and a later extraction of the foraging body, neurosurgery was performed a temporary ventriculostomy. The second case is a 27-year-old patient who was manipulated a homemade weapon. Uh, upon admission, the patient was reported discomfort when listening, so when they removed the dressing, we realized that the metal object came out into the auricular. Region. However, when when we uh, 
make an X-ray. Um, tomography no, no was the damage was observed at the brain level, so most specialists disturb the patient, even the patient in search of ophthalmology and maxillofacial. And a, a temporary approach was performing, extracted for any body, like, like we can see, and placing of the synthesis at the lateral wall and floor of the orbit and an inflation of the right eye. The third case is a 22-year-old patient who was in rehabilitation, uh, drugs and alcohol, and had a, a, a delirium tremens episode and had inserted himself a pen three days after three days before being admitted to the clinic. In this case, due to the ocular integrity as the pen pierced at the brain stem. The, the, it is responsibility of neurosurgery to extract the foreign body. Ophthalmology just was observing the procedure, but the IE structure was okay. So the patient had a low chance of survival due to the injury itself. But by miracle, the patient survived. And the last case is a 28-year-old patient who was involved in a motorcycle accident. The patient was not wearing a helmet. And the report described that as a, the, he flew out after the impact. He fell on a run iron door and thus inviting the spirit like decoration into the ocular orbit. And the firefighters could disperse and took him to. For any body was extracted by neurosurgery and ophthalmology performed an enucleation. The patient, however, passed away due to the complication of other injuries. Here it is evident that orbitocranial trauma could be complicated by traumatic injuries that compromise life or could leave long sequels in patients. So this is my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Dr. Alok, uh, you have any comments? Thank you, Dr. Wendy, for a presentation. Dr. Alok uh, from uh, uh, Australia. Or Dr. Mukherjee, sir, you want to say something? No, you unmute. Unmute, sir. Dr. Alok, unmute. Dr. Bendy, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much for sharing these cases. And we realize that uh, many times we have got uh, these uh, injuries where we could have uh, industrial accidents or motor vehicle accidents where we can have uh, ocular involvement and um, we could have the uh, intracranial involvements as well. So uh, thank you very much for sharing this. Thank you. Can I speak? You see that uh, because injuries are varied types, but he has covered. But the automobile accident or the road traffic accident injuries are most grievous injuries, and they are mostly the polytrauma type of injuries. So uh, first thing is to save their lives, and then look, look for the eyes. But I think it should be a joint uh, approach from the internist and from the pharmacist to save the eye also in the intensive care unit or any particular place where they are treating these polytrauma cases. So for this matter, actually the awareness should be created uh, among the public so that uh, uh, this trauma can be prevented, particularly road traffic accidents, certain of the domestic tra traumas. This can be easily, uh, by creating awareness, can be prevented to major extent. For the road traffic accident, I can tell you, that uh, in 1988 there was a regulation and um, that regulation was following for a long time and in 2019 they have changed it because they conducted a survey throughout the country and they have seen because of the negligence most of the um, uh, uh, this uh, road traffic accident occur because of the non uh, application of the helmet or the non application of the seat belt and not following the proper traffic rules so for that matter, this, uh, this uh, transport authority and the police, they have conducted the surveys and based on their results, they have seen 
that every day there are about 98 people are uh, either there is death or there is they are previously injured. So that by this process they have introduced severe fines, cash fine, cash fine as well as they have they are going to impound their license and all these things. So this has brought down to a major extent. They have shown that there, there is about 51 percent reduction in the uh, major traumas due to the road traffic accident. So these are the few things that I thought I should uh, just point out. Otherwise, the presentation was excellent. Thank you, Dr. I, I take this. Uh, thank you. And I think we just know we saw Dr. Ron Yeo, Sanjeev Mohan, and Purendra uh, Basin as uh, joined. And I take this opportunity to request Dr. Mukherjee, our uh, president of uh, Opera Trauma Society of India, who is celebrating the Silver Jubilee of Opera Trauma Society of India. And he successfully conducted a second international uh, uh, <coughs> webinar yesterday. And today I request him to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Parihar. Dr. Parihar, sir. Dr. Dr. Mukherjee, to introduce Dr. Parihar. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee, thank you. Sir. This is my privilege to introduce Dr. Parihar, who is very close to me in one way, from all and every aspect. Dr. Parihar is a major general retired, and uh, he has a multifarious uh, activities besides ophthalmology. And uh, in ophthalmology also, he is a uh, versatile surgeon. He tackles different type of cases. And uh, experience in ocular trauma is immense for him because he was in armed forces. And um, I, uh, I have seen the cases that he has done. And uh, starting from the repair of the corneal room to the posterior segment also to some extent and the glaucoma valve for the glaucoma cases. This is a short introduction for Dr. Parihar. He is an excellent person and good orator. Thank you, Dr. Parihar. Please carry on. Yeah, uh, before I start, I will request uh, Madam Lakshmi to give me a minute, and after that, I will request her to start video. Thank you very much, sir, Mukherjee, sir, for kind words. He is a teacher of the teachers, so I enjoy this privilege. About uh, word on the topic. boss. Yeah. 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 बस अभी थोड़ा पुरेंद्र मुझे भी ठीक रहने दो। I request पुरेंद्र and everybody to mute yourself when the speaker is speaking. Yeah, I thank you very much पुरेंद्र for intervening and give me little breath. About the trauma management, I just on the lighter part, I add that the trauma start. Yeah, please hold on here. Then you uh, just keep it here, please. Just hold on here. Just pause it, please pause it. Yes, uh, let me let me introduce the uh, video part. So that emotional trauma and ocular trauma starts with the first eye blinking at the age of 16 between boys and girls. From there, this trauma starts and then keep on having a wiping eyes till the last breath, so the lighter part. About these cases, as the Dr. Mukherjee and uh, Dr. Natarajan has also mentioned that we don't use, and Professor Subhadi too, that we don't use the preventive uh, measures to avoid ocular trauma. And in the sports injuries, this is the most common that nobody is using uh, preventive uh, spectacles to prevent the trauma. Amongst all ocular trauma in sports injuries, I would say most of them are the polyocular trauma. Rarely you will find that only a small uh, corneal tear is there. There may be a corneal tear, there may be a cataract, there may be iridodialysis, angle recession, and above and all, the Natarajan's uh, domain, with invisible but posterior segment involvement will, will be there. Three most common uh, concepts of the injuries which takes place is a, in our country, is a, in the sports, is a cricket ball, badminton, squash and tennis ball. Among these two, the golf and squash ball are the most disastrous to give the trauma. Now, here is a case, the two small clips I am showing. The first top one is a badminton injury in a 40-year-old person who had developed, you can see, iridodialysis. There is a traumatic cataract. Other than that, what you could not see is this. There was an angle recession of almost 60%. There is a iridodialysis. Other than there is a zonulysis and the rupture of the posterior capsule. So this type of cataract plus there was a vitreous hemorrhage. So you need needs a multi-prong specialties with the qualified VR surgeon has to perform the duty. 
in this case we did the iridodialysis since there was a massive uh, zonulysis and posterior capsular dehiscence the cataract management was done by the phaco fragmentation and uh, glued iol was put since it has a two third angle recession so the procedure was done with the with the uh, agv the second small clip followed in is a massive corneal multiple uh, injuries having a lacerated tear involving a uh, you have the scleral and the posterior segment was grossly deranged in those cases it is basically for repair to restore the globe which is more very unlikely in a massive injuries particularly in pediatric case but it gives chance for the next person to operate and provide the visual rehabilitation so we our aim is to do the in maintain integrity and ultimately the visual rehabilitation now i'll request uh, uh, madam lakshmi to uh, start the video please rahul please start the video rahul yeah you can see here it's a big uh, iridodialysis and uh, you have to uh, plan procedure and from the i don't like to do the intervention in between so from a we planned in a such a manner so that we provide the best uh, possible outcome for a long time after all he is a 40 44 year old person he has a, another 50 years to go ahead so deliberately we decided to go with the phaco fragmentation and glued iol rather than attempting uh, ctr and other rings to put the lens and see that whether it may remain stable or not because if there is a faecal zonulysis is more than uh, two third it is unlikely that this kind of a lens will remain in the position and patient uh, we did it almost eight months ago is doing uh, extremely well so the proper uh, posterior segment uh, engagement was done in this case and uh, here this uh, i uh, have a uh, posterior segment surgeon uh, dr sora varora who did this part remaining part was the iridodialysis and uh, glaucoma ball iol etc was uh, performed by uh, myself and uh, major issue remains with this uh, polyocular trauma is with the glaucoma or uh, macular involvement they may develop erm they may develop some other Uh, blunt injuries or any kind of a delayed changes so one has to keep guard and you can never be uh, privileged to give a excellent uh, prognosis in these cases if the patient is getting useful vision it's always a pleasure to share so that is another very important that we have to give a long term guarded visual prognosis iridodialysis there are various ways to handle and uh, all these young patients angle recessions more than uh, half my preference is with the glaucoma wall because i have seen that in these cases we have a follow up varying from 7 to 10 year and they are doing extremely well whereas the trabeculectomy in these cases is not that uh, successful you can see that the case is uh, managed and this is the message which i am pro procuring providing everywhere this is the second uh, video very small clip it is basically to highlight that the basic principles of that whatever was earlier try to restore that and the most important in these cases is the limbal suture you have to see that you don't have a collar like my collar the one collar is going up and down which invariably seen in uh, corneal repair that the limbus has been changed and from the circular you have the zag pattern and here you may have to do suturing again and again you may have to put the 80 sutures then to restore it and you have to change accordingly and tissue respect is very very important with the present invent of steroids and antibiotics etc these the sympathetic ophthalmitis with incarcerated uveal tissue is becoming very rare commodities so we prefer that as much as tissue you can restore in these cases is always better and in such situations you may have to have the multiple surgeries 
once the eye is settled down you may have to see the anterior rectus segment reconstruction as well as uh, corneal transplant iul implantation but with this such massive trauma it is always better to do in a phased manner to control inflammation particularly in pediatric cases i think i am uh, my time is over ji thank sir, you no? pariyar sir yeah your time is over sir. thank you sir yes thank you very much my time is over for this webinar but my time is yet to come <laughs> very true sir very true you are always on the on in demand and always on the top sir and you will be always liked by everybody yeah. and you the kind of cases which you have shown were really challenging and so nicely managed i really appreciate your efforts sir um, for the glaucoma as you what was the age of the first patient wherein there was a mature cataract with uh, yeah, yeah. probably you were busy in talking it was 44 year old and 44 it, years old yeah and it was a badminton injury okay shuttle cock injury shuttle cock injury uh, it was so nicely managed and good part is that posterior segment was good in this particular macula and retina was good that is really it, very nice patient was, patient was lucky That he had a good rating. Yeah. Dr. Parya, in the second case, what a chance of infection? Because it's a very multiple injury. You can say almost to cornea sclera. Yeah, yeah. I I fully agree. That is why I said that there is a possibility of infection, sympathetic ophthalmitis. But despite that, I advocate that we should respect tissue and abscission. You have to give them uh, systemic as well as intravitreal and all these injury cases, whether it is a. anterior segment or posterior segment we are giving intravitreal vancomycin in, in these cases without failure steroids what are the steroids steroids are given systemic steroids are given to these cases but not immediately we start after 48 hours so uh, you gave a intravitreal um, antibiotic vancomycin in all cases of trauma with the yes, with the globe yes, globe yeah, injury yeah. open globe injury, injury. injury moment you have a cataract involvement and particularly because you don't know about the posterior segment and are not posterior segment the posterior capsule so it is a practice in trauma cases but because most of them they are not the sterile cases this is sport injuries may be sterile but other trauma cases are highly contaminated whether mm -hmm. it is a operational or the <coughs> occupational there is always there may be a uh, war injuries the pellets etc <coughs> or the road traffic accident that is stones and all those can lead to that the battle object so it is always better moment you are entering into the anterior chamber in these cases the secondary endophthalmitis is always at uh, risk i think we were discussing this yesterday also and it was highlighted by dr fonsika um, it's a nice case wonderful case sir thank, thank you, you sir. thank you very much yeah dr alok sharma yes So next is Dr. Rona, sir. Dr. Natarajan, sir. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but uh, any other question I'm asking, Dr. Dr. Alok, uh, unmute yourself. Dr. Alok, Alok unmute. Un unmute. Unmute, Dr. Alok. Uh, Dr. Prahar, I apologize. I uh, echo your uh, uh, statement that I think integrity of the globe is the most important thing. Uh, and uh, uh, putting the structures at the right place is important and obviously we should be sitting like a hawk and watching the glaucoma in the long run now in australia we get these injuries where we could have you know there is a bird called magpie which looks like crow right so you can have a direct injury into the eye which could be impacting on the cornea uh, on the lens and it could as much as affect the retina as well so so there, definitely there is a multiple a uh, team involvement so we we uh, treat the infections and the cornea and then later on and maybe anterior segment cataract and then we go on to do the surgery for the retina and the glaucoma is required thank you thank sir you. thanks for your uh, wisdom pulse of wisdom and uh, good comment on this it strengthen our belief thank you sir thank you dr pariha and thank you dr alok and dr purendra for the comments and next i have the Pleasant duty of welcoming my friend Dr. Ronald Leo, who is my old friend. I think one of my very old friend, but he is very. I have to share my 
Can I share my screen? Oh, you're going to share your screen first. Uh, hi, Ron. Yes. Hi, Ron. Good afternoon. I'll just share my screen for a minute and then... Okay, I'll stop sharing share. mine first. Yeah, yes. So I just wanted to show your handsome picture. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, so Ron Yeo is a clinical associate professor at uh, Duke NUS Graduate Medical School and Singapore National Eye Center and is a founding partner of Eye and Retina Surgeon Singapore. I just recently visited him in uh, January. He has been active for many years in teaching the finer points of fake emulsification, plaques, and advanced technology lens implantation. He is the immediate past president of the Asia Pacific Association of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons and sits on the program committee of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgeons. In recognition of his work in cataract and implant surgery, he was elected to the International Intraocular Implant Club in 2012 and was appointed to the executive committee as the secretary in 2018. And more than that, his topic is uh, uh, the uh, 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 quest for beauty. And I think he's an excellent photographer. And I, yeah, I don't know how many of you are following him. I think it's a pleasure to watch him in the Facebook. And I think he has uh, carries the old camera, uh, rather rather uh, latest camera using the black and white. And I every time try to post for him. And I think uh, I, he calls uh, that I'm the most well dressed, but I think he's the most uh, uh, man who uh, looks in for a quest for beauty. And I present you. And he actually is a, I know him for more than 30 years. And thanks to him and Dr. Uh, uh, Lim, Arthur Lim, who uh, I'm very close to Singapore. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my... Thank you, Ron, for being here. Thank you very much for that very kind and generous uh, introduction, uh, Nati. Uh, I hope you all can see my screen now. Yes, yes. Okay, excellent. So, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, at this Ocular Trauma Symposium of uh, OSOS. And I've given this really quite mystical uh, title called A Quest for Beauty, and you will see why. Um, so this lady of 60, who had previous LASIK, decided she wanted to look more beautiful. So she went uh, and had an upper lip blepharoplasty. But what's interesting, she had it done by a general practitioner. And I don't know whether in India GPs do this, but in Singapore GPs are allowed to do this. And after she had the blepharoplasty, she told the doctor, I can't see. And her vision had dropped from to, to, to counting fingers only. And so the, the GP quickly sent her along to our clinic. And this is what we saw. And you can see right in the middle, there's a cataract. We dilated her up. The cataract's still there. But you can see that the anterior chamber is looking rather odd. Uh, the anterior capsule is looking rather odd through the red reflex. And we're wondering what's happened to this anterior capsule. Then we looked more carefully at the cornea and here, this looks suspiciously like a, a, a puncture mark of some sort. And we put it on an OCT. You can see that there is actually a needle track going through in one cut. And in the other cut, confirms that there is actually a, a needle track puncture. So we're suspecting at this time that the GP maybe poked something into the eye that he shouldn't have. So we called him. And he said, well, I had no problems with the blepharoplasty. Well, of course not. I only sedated her, which is why the patient probably didn't feel anything. Use topical anesthesia, which is why anything that went into the eye, she wouldn't have felt either. And he gave an injection of local anesthetic into the upper lip or the blepharoplasty. And we suspect that this injection may have somehow gone through the eyelid, into the cornea and into the lens. So here's the, the, the patient's eye on the operating table. A table and you know you can't really see very clearly the state of the anterior capsule so of course when you've got a case like this you should uh, use vision blue so vision blue has been put in and now evacuated using ovd and you can see that the anterior capsule is very ragged distally here so we start the capsulorexis subincisionally and when we get around there that we think is where trouble is and we're able to do the left side of the capsulorexis but thankfully it doesn't go peripherally then we use the scissors to cut on the right side so that we can then at least get a decent capsulorexis to continue with the surgery. The challenging thing and the interesting thing about trauma is that you never know what to expect, right? And you really don't know the extent of the seriousness in most cases. So here we're able to finish the capsulorexis and I'm helping my colleague do, do this case. And here the FACO was quite uneventful and, 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 and he's just completed removing 
the, 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 the nucleus and he's about to take it out. Now, the important point here is that with a radial tear here, you always want to inject either air or OVD into the eye before removing the phaco tip so that the chamber doesn't change. Do the IA and at the end of the IA, you should do the same thing, inject air or OVD. Now, you know, this is because in theory, if you decompress the anterior chamber by putting it out, radial tears can extend to the back. Now, have any of you ever seen radial tears ex extending to the back? Well, here's a case. You know, this is one of my residents doing the case and you can see the radial tear here uh, on the left. And before I could tell him to uh, put OVD in, into the eye, pulls the instrument out of the eye and watch that. Did you see that little snap there? That was the posterior capsule going. So I can tell you categorically, if you have a radial tear, inject something before you remove your irrigating instrument out. So here at the end, we've decided to put in a three-piece uh, PMMA lens uh, for a couple of reasons. So mainly because the haptics will sit very nicely in the capsular bag, and we can then, as you can see, nudge that optic into an optic capture procedure. And at the end, you get a very nice uh, looking eye. The next day, the patient was able to see 6, 7.5 unaided. Uh, which was, he, he was quite happy, um, but he wasn't very happy with his surgeon, obviously. So let, let's, let's look back at the learning points, okay? Anything is possible when needles are poked into the eye or near the eye. You should use tripan blue, slow mo phaco because you don't want to cause extension of the tears, prevent anterior chamber shallowing as I showed you earlier. And, you know, you have to choose your IOL. You could have put a single piece IOL in this, but in this case, a, a three piece was fine. And I think you want to choose your blepharoplasty surgeon very carefully. Now, what was interesting was that this patient was actually very nice and, and didn't want to sue the, 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 the GP who'd done this. The, 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 <coughs> um, she said, if the GP would just pay for her cataract surgery, she will be happy. You know what the GP your said? Time is up. I'm sorry. Yeah, the GP said, I'll, I'll pay half your fee. And, and now it's a, there's a lawsuit pending. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ron. I think a uh, great learning from your uh, video and your the case. And I think uh, uh, in case if the what did you what made you do the OCT? Generally, you do a <coughs> OCT. No, we don't do a routine OCT in in that sort of case. I mean, it's because I think we suspected there would be medical legal implications that you'd want to make it totally documented. Yes, and uh, today I actually have a live online OCT in my OR, and that would have shown shown that as well. Okay, so I think. Uh, did you try, uh, did you try UVM? UVM? I'm sorry. Did you try UVM? Uh, no, that one was actually UVM. That was actually UVM. That 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 first one. But I have a, a live OCT on my Zeiss in the OT now that we can use the OCT there. So if someone does the UVM preoperatively, we can know the status of the posterior capsule, particularly yes. in that type of injury. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, can I ask you something, Dr. Ron? Sure, Anura. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering in the first case that you exhibited, uh, the radial tear was yeah. along your entry. I mean, uh, would along, you be interested to within. change? Yeah, yeah. Would you be interested to change the phaco incision so that the business area lies tangential to the plane of the radial tear? Would that uh, would that be That's more helpful? That's a pretty in interesting suggestion. You know, um, I think there is some logic in what you suggest. Although I, I think that if you manage it properly, as we showed, that if you just inject something before you take instruments out of the eye, yeah, you probably won't won't cause it to extend. Actually, this extension is very rare. I mean, I have to say, in my thirty years of practice, you know, we've seen radial tears, and in the early days before I was so assiduous, I would take instruments out of the eye. Most of the time, it doesn't extend until that one case uh, that happened. So. You know, when that happens, you kind of believe that the theory is true. And, and, and I think we just be careful. It probably doesn't matter too much. Thank you. Great, uh, great, uh, Ron. Have a nice, nice uh, afternoon. In, thank you. Uh, I'm having uh, lunch with my family. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Sumudi. Dr. Diana, sir. Next to Dr. Anura. Yeah. I'll share the screen. <clears throat> yes. Uh, 
uh, one of my stalwarts from Odisha, my states, Dr. Andhraj Misra. Uh, whatever things are given here is uh, too less for his capabilities and uh, career. But however, it's customary to read these things. So he completed his MBBS from uh, SC Medical College in 1999 and MS in 2003. He had two long-term fellowships in IOL and inter-segment and pediatric ophthalmology, um, Stabismus from Aurobindo Hospital, Madurai. He has 13 years of experience then on and faculty invited in various society, 30 life surgeries has performed and publications in peer-reviewed journals, passionate about understanding the technology and at present he is the director of the Radha, Mon, uh, Radha Ramon Hospital, Eye Hospital at Katak and also a partner in the Carbijan Eye Hospital, Bhuvaneshwar. So these are the very few about him, he is a very versatile person and the master in everything besides the academics and ophthalmology. So I welcome you him to share his views in this appellate trauma. Thank you, Dr. Andrad. Please do come. Yeah. I'm stopping. Yes. Welcome, Andrak. You have to stop your sh screen share, sir. I stopped, yeah. I stopped. Please carry on. Right. Thank you so much for the overwhelming generosity, uh, Professor Buddhi. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are. Greetings and regards from the land of Lord Jagannath. Uh, I wish to see, not stare. I want vision, not glare. So speaks somebody who is a 22 years old soul, suffered a trauma from a cricket ball eight months back, and chooses me as the fifth consultant he visits to because the first four told him that you're not going to have as good a vision, a vision as you expect to. And more importantly, there is inevitable post-operative glare, all thanks to this uh, uh, tonically dilated traumatic midriasis. The patient had a total cataract. There was no uh, zonular laxity anywhere. There were trophic patches in the iris everywhere. And the posterior segment was echo-free. So we went about the cataract surgery I promised him whatever uh, best I can do. There were corneal opacity, which will be prominent after I stain the capsule right here. The sinicolysis was done with viscoelastic, injecting under the iris to free the iris from whatever little adhesion it had with the capsule. Rexis and uh, lens uh, aspiration was not very difficult in this particular case because the zonules held while my assistant was getting ready with a 10 on nylon suture with long needles to do the subsequent procedure. I had to bring the iris down. I had to do a pupilloplasty and keeping its centrality alive. So after I put in a single piece hydrophobic IOL into the back, I manually maneuver the iris through both side ports just to increase their mobility. And then I start the single pass four throw pupilloplasty always keeping the Purkinje image in line. So the Purkinje image has to be in the central location. For us, you take a bite from the distal end, pass it on to its opposite end. I first try the pupillary border, feed it into the 26 gauge needle, which is waiting at the other end, remove the needle along with the 10 on nylon needle with its suture, pull a loop out through the side port and then pass four Side, and then tie it to produce the pupillary shortening or squeezing in the inferior part. I choose this part first because this was the healthiest iris segment that was there with the patient. Mind you, the Parkinji image from the microscope is again central. Then I do it on the superior side so that we get the pupillary size of the desired uh, dimension that we want. So the pupillary borders are opposed first to construct a pupil at the center, and then it's tied. Now we have a pupil which has a central Purkinje image located, so we are not shifting from the nodal point. And then the defects in the periphery can be sutured next. But in here, since it's a stab incision at the other end, so the, the loop has to be pulled from the other side. But the procedure is the same. All of them are single pass and four throw. And finally, we close this defect. Now there is 
there is an lucration, there is a temptation to pierce the iris with the left hand where the 26 gauge needle is sitting, but it punches through a much, much larger hole and the already disturbed iris uh, uh, and the trophic iris does not oppose very well. So this is the end of the procedure where the pupil look like this. The Barkinji image is still sitting central. This is a seven days post-op. And this is the 15th day post-op picture. The patient has a 612 partial test corrected visual acuity and definitely did not have any clear to complain. Thank you so much for the exuberant uh, audience exhibited, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, I rest. Excellent. Excellent, Anurag. I have a question. What, what, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. What about the posture segment the visualization later? Because he's only a 22-year-old person. So in future, if you go anything in the uh, posture segment uh, examination surgery, so how can you proceed? So, well, to start with, what we have to ensure is that the posterior capsule is integral and there are no vitreous, uh, vitreous opacities in the form of cortical fragments dropping in. The posterior segment was echo-free on scan. And after the surgery, we have this, this patient, this uh, surgery was done, I think, around three, four <coughs> months uh, back. So we have now the opportunity to examine the posterior segment. He's doing fine there. The 6 <laughs> partial is perhaps due to the corneal opacities, which were lying very central. And... Uh, uh, it, it keeps on improving and the scar is lessening a bit, but it was, I mean, he delayed the procedure way too much just because he had an apprehension of uh, continuous glare post-operatively as was told to him uh, by the previous consultants. Dr. Sanjeev, please unmute yourself, sir. Please unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Honorat, sir. Hello. Yes, uh, Dr. Anurag, I think I was really impressed by your suturing technique of, for the uh, iris. Very nicely done. I congratulate you for that. Not, it's not an easy job. Now, one question, uh, if you can answer that, or maybe Dr. Natarajan, what if you had uh, found that the patient had a detachment because it was a cricket ball injury? And uh, would you suggest to go ahead with the detachment surgery in the same sitting, or would you like to do it in the second stage? I'd like to know your opinion. If you have a vitro-retinal consultant at the same sitting with you and you as an anterior segment, would you like to go ahead with the VR surgery after you have removed the cataract? Or would you like to wait for the inflammation to settle down and go for a second stage? I think I would let Dr. Natarajan ask that because I'm a standalone practitioner. I don't have a vitro-retinal consultant with me. However, in the other hospital I have at Bhubaneswar, I do have a colleague who is an excellent vitreoretinal surgeon. So probably I would have taken the patient there to uh, to take an opinion from her at least. But Dr. Natarajan would probably have a better answer than this. I always, uh, I always do it as a combined surgery. Like both the yeah, anti-segment surgeon does the cataract with the intraocular implant and I proceed with the vitreoretinal surgery at the same sitting. Present day concept is uh, to do a pole-to-pole -pole surgery. So whatever injury you have an anterior segment, you have the anterior segment surgeon and you have a, a standby posterior segment surgeon so that if you are thinking that there is something wrong in the posterior segment, in one go it should be done. That gives the better result. That is the recent concept about the management of total globe injury. Sir, sir? Uh, one question from my side. No? Yes, Bhagavad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Subodhi sir was asking that uh, whether if any there is posterior segment pathology, how, how the people will uh, behave. I think Subodhi sir, you are asking that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, if there is retinal detachment or vitreous hemorrhage, if a posterior segment surgeon want to go behind or you want to uh, see the posterior segment properly of thoracic serrata, then how the people will behave. I think what you are asking. Yeah, yeah. So, Natarajan sir or uh, Dr. Jian uh, Rao sir. Yes. Yes. No, 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 no. <coughs> Small, you are saying. Yeah. Now, what is the question? Question is after pupilloplasty. Yeah. With the suture, if there is a posterior pathology surgery need or better visualization, how the people behave in this scenario? No, one is I use wide angle, but I, usually anything to do with the pupil, I tell them to do after the repairing the retina so that you have a good view. But after doing a pupil plastic, if you use a clip, it will be a problem again and it will tear the iris. So I think uh, probably we will repair the pupil later. Okay. Okay. The last stage of, okay. In the last stage of surgery, we may repair the pupil, but we do retina first, then lens insertion, then pupil plastic. 
Now, yeah. if, uh, in case, Correct. in case, if it happens after this procedure, yeah. after a month or two months or six months, then uh, how will you proceed? Yes. How will the retina? Will it cause a problem <laughs> in the retina evaluation and surgery, Professor Natarajan? Uh, no, I, I think uh, no. If it will happen later, I think then uh, we, if we already have one month or something like that, I think you can use uh, iris clip to enlarge the pupil and then remove it off. It will be all right. No, I think uh, that is a question for the anterior segment to decide that uh, in case there, if Dr. Anurag has seen on the ultrasound or probably uh, OCT, if it can be done, if he has found that there's a detachment, then Dr. Anurag or any anterior segment can go ahead with the cataract surgery, put the lens implant, but not do the pupilloplasty, don't suture the iris, and do it uh, after the vitro retinal surgery if the patient is continuing to have the glare. That's yeah. what I feel. I think anterior segment surgeon's job is to make sure that the posterior segment is okay and probably doesn't require a post, uh, posterior segment surgery. One more question is there, Dr. Anurag, because the patient was having central corneal opacity in this particular patient. So if you are reducing the size of the pupil, the, size, the light which is going through will be obstructed more because of this pupiloplasty which we have done. So the only way uh, this, this particular opacity was a nebulomacular opacity at the most, and it was a paracentral opacity, not very central opacity. But if you leave the pupil dilated, the irregular refraction will be more from the edges of the scare, uh, ed edges of the scar. So the, uh, uh, apart from bringing the pupil down and the glare, it also probably adds on to the pinhole effect because I left a three millimeters pupil. So uh, it also augmented vision to an extent. That's the best we could do. Uh, we have a, we have an option of doing PTK. Using exactly. if there is so a, that you can eliminate the opacity. It depends on the yeah. depth of the yeah. opacity. It, yes. it will depend on the depth of the opacity, yes. uh, how they, deep they are. We can do it and we, it can manage the re, re, residual refractive error also to some extent if it is there. We can correct the residual refractive error as well. It wasn't much and yes, PTK definitely was an option in this case because the scar was not very deep. Mm -hmm. So usually we do in such cases PTK to uh, decrease uh, to improve the quality of vision and it corrects the uh, if there is any cylindrical power or the residual refractive error because the IOL power calculation is also very challenging in these cases to get the right keratometry is also a challenge uh, so that desired keratometry so that is one. Everybody must look at the next speaker yeah. and. Uh, so, to introduce the next patient, Dr. Anura, very good uh, video and very good discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Next speaker, Dr. Pravin Subhati. Yes. So is this slide visible? Yes. So it's uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pravin Subhati, an illustrious <coughs> uh, consultant of uh, Odisha who has done his MD from Arbin Madurai in Cornea and Refract, he's a Cornea and Refract Surgeon, Chief Consultant at Ruby Eye Hospital, Barampur. He has done his Cornea Fellowship and ICO Fellowship also from Switzerland. He is to join repent of BBS AIOS. He has 16 publications in various national and international journals. He is a reviewer for clinical ophthalmology and he has received innovative award in the field of cornea by Pub Index. And he has won first prize in AIOS quiz competition in 2009. With this few, few of his achievements, and uh, he is a proud son of our professor Leonard Subuddhi. Though, but he has also earned a name for himself in the state and also at the national level. So, with this introduction, I invite Dr. Pravin to share his slide. Thank you, sir, for the kind words. And I would like to thank uh, the Trauma Society and Odisha State Society for giving this opportunity to present my case of uh, chemical injury. So this is the patient, a 25-year-old male. Play the slides. A 25-year-old male who was referred to us with complaints of defecting vision, sudden in onset following fall of Lyme injury. Patient had a primary management at local hospital with uh, copious irrigation and topical antibiotics. 
So following which we saw and we started him on conservative therapy with steroids, anti-glaucoma drugs, oral vitamin C. But after a period of four weeks to six weeks, uh, the, you can see here in the low, uh, lower picture, there is uh, inflammation, the conjunctival inflammation is not subsiding and there is a circumciliary congestion is there and inferiorly there is just uh, limbal ischemia because of the uh, lime which is deposited in the cornea in the lower part. So our primary intention uh, to do any surgical procedure here is to reduce the inflammation so that we can restore some amount of ocular surface and once we can restore the ocular surface, we can later on do any form of visual restoration. Here what I did, uh, I managed uh, this case with multiple layers of uh, amniotic membrane transplant. The same picture which I showed you earlier. And you can see I went with a DUAS classification, by I prefer DUAS classification. So you can see here in the DUAS classification, it comes into the in the grade of six, grade six. It has a very poor prognosis. And if you could see here, because of the line, it has caused a 12 uh, clock hours of involvement and total conjunctiva is involved. And the prognosis is very, very poor. Still then, it's our uh, primary aim, our as a doctor, we need to preserve, we, give, we should have, we should give him some amount of functional vision so that uh, we feel satisfied as a surgeon. What I did here, I did, I went for initially a 360 degree peritomy. You have to do a 360 degree peritomy and remove the subtenons here a little bit. You have to expose the sclera. The more you dissect, you need to get the right plane and the more you dissect, it is better. And with a Bart, uh, Bart Parker blade, you need to just remove that line uh, deposit which is present in the inferior cornea. You need to get the right plane and slowly you need to dissect because already there is a corneal thinning and melt there. If you do a lot of dissection, uh, which you don't want on table. Layer of So this is the first layer which is placed over the ocular surface. So majorly the amniotic membrane acts like a bandage contact lens. Just need to tuck it under the conjunctiva and anchor it properly. Followed by second layer. So more the layers, at least it would be better also. You can go for three to four layers also. So that gives a good support to the ocular surface. Followed by, I thought of doing a tarsoraphy to allow the ocular surface to heal by itself. And after four weeks, uh, you can see that there was a pretty good uh, restoration of the ocular surface. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for a wonderful presentation. Can I ask Dr. Mukherjee to make a quick uh, comment? Dr. Mukherjee? I would like to know from Praveen yeah. that uh, how did this patient uh, got this uh, Lyme 1? What is the history?
question sir how this patient got the lime bark what is the history because you know the history how he got the lime bark how did the patient did get the lime bark got the lime bark it was a workplace injury sir he told me the history he told me so normally what happens this type of lime bark yes sir uh, happens in a domestic type of injury when there is a deposit of the lime into the cornea the similar actually slide i showed yesterday that uh, in tamil nadu and particularly in the eastern part of the india people uh, have the habit of chewing the tamaku and all this uh, brittle so what happens they purchase the uh, this lime in a pouch plastic pouch and those plastic pouches are so friable that when they open up it just pouts out of the uh, pouch and falls into the eye for this matter yes, actually yes. from the sankar netra lai they have done a study and they have shown that there are a lot of children they are getting the lime burn in the tamil nadu uh, state they have yes, put yes. a request to the honorable vice president of india Uh, to take into the matter, and they have also, I think, uh, put a uh, RTI to prevent these pouches or to have a better packing of these tunas. They are yes. getting the lot of children. They are getting these tuna injuries. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Pravin and Dr. Uh, I think next uh, I have Professor uh, Yoke, my good friend. Can I, Dr. Yoke, can I share the screen for a minute? Yes, thank you. So uh, I just wanted to uh, introduce Dr. Professor Yake, who is my very good friend from uh, I Institute of Zhejiang University, I Center of Second Affiliated Hospital of Zhejiang University College of Medicine, China. He is the president. Sir, you are not of able to see the screen, sir. Oh, one second. Now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Fine. He is my very good friend, and he is the president of Chinese Ophthalmic Society, president of Chinese Cataract Society, and he is my colleague in board of trustee, member of the International Council of Ophthalmology, member of the Academy of Ophthalmology Internationalis, regional secretary of Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology, vice president of Asia Pacific Association of Cataract and Refractive Surgeon, international intraocular implant club member. So he has published 415 articles, including 211 papers indexed by Scientific. Uh, citation index seven national invention patents he and his team have received over 30 national and provincial grants award the national award of science and technology progress three times zhejiang province so golden apple award aps heroes gold award aps heroes ac award italian ophthalmological society antonio scarpo medal an international media lecture us sino of thalmology golden key award and us sino of thalmology golden apple award outstanding achievement award of chinese ophthalmic society chinese physician award judge of national science and technology advance prize of china and national natural science foundation of china editor in chief of ophthalmology i world in asia pacific version again my colleague that i am manage the indian and i think we is a great a great accomplishment and more than that great human being and my good friend thank you professor yoke okay, for joining us and now i stop my sharing my screen and you can share your screen it's a great uh, opportunity and uh, thanks for you to share your views to the world here yeah. yeah dear professor nataraj dear india of samajas good morning it's my great honor to be invited to attend your virtual symposium on ocular trauma my name is yao ke from zhejiang university hangzhou china first of all on behalf of chinese ophthalmological society and the chinese cataract and the refractive uh, refractive uh, surgery society I would like to extend my warm congratulations on the successful opening of this virtual symposium. Today my talk is traumatic zonal deficiency managed by Flex. Let's watch the video. 
This is a 60 years old male patient with a brown contusion to the left eye. The diagnosis was traumatic cataract with zonal dehiscence. I choose lens sex flex for this case. You can see during managing frame to second laser that the lens was mild dislocation and the OCT should lens a little bit tilt. I used the lens six system to create a five millimeters capsulotomy and to obtain six pieces in a cross pattern for nuclear fragmentation. Then I changed to the fecal emissification process. You see the lens dislocation from three o'clock to six o'clock. So I did two holes for the capsule hooks to fix the capsule. You see, it's the first hook. And then another hook to fix the capsule. So then I do the fecal emissification. Usually I prefer the stop and chop. Yeah, because of the pre-fragmentation, I just do a very shallow, uh, not very deep, a scar, scar uh, in the nucleus, then chopper along the laser section and the chop and the crack lens. Yeah. Because yeah, we use the uh, laser pre-fragmentation, uh, so the procedure gets uh, much easier. So I do very gentle, very gently uh, to to uh, fecal the nucleus to avoid the disturb the capsule back. Under the OVD, I insert the capsule tension ring, CTR, by manual method. Now we usually use the injector to inject the CTR into back. back. It makes easier than the manual method. and imprint the intraocular lens. Usually I prefer the c loop lens into the back because the dislocation is not so big and CTR in the back. So I aspirate the OVD from the anterior chamber and close the incision by one stitch of sutures. Keep the stable, or uh, keep the anterior chamber stable. It's very important. And then remove the capsule hooks. And then a little bit BSS, yeah, keep, uh, ensure the, sta uh, the entry chamber stay stable and lens stable. So usually I would like to remove this, a stitch of suture one week post operatively. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor AOK, for uh, joining us and uh, uh, maybe you can stop sharing and uh, Dr. Alok Sharma or Dr. Mukherjee, uh, can you uh, have, have any questions or comments? Uh, I think that's a beautiful surgery, uh, Dr. Yeo. Um, uh, is, uh, can I ask one question, Dr. Yeo? Why did you use Lensex in this case? Why didn't you want to go for the normal FACO? Yeah, you see the uh, the fecal just the, the first reason is for the capsule 
Laudame is, is very safe and uh, uh, it's easy to not disturb the capsule, uh, capsule so much. And, and a very important reason is the pre-fragmentation. Is uh, use the lens X, we, we can cut the lens to six piece and very easy to uh, fake and to uh, to chop and to aspirate the fecal misification the lens not avoid to disturb the capsule bags. Thank you. And I, yeah, I think uh, can I can I make a comment, sir? Yes. Yeah, I think the uh, key to success in such cases is suspending the capsular bag vertically with the help of capsular hooks. And if you're using the uh, femtolaser, then you already have an opening. You know where to suspend it. You know the area which is identified. And with the high definition OCT of the anterior capsule, it shows you an excellent hump. It gives you the highest point and the lowest point on the anterior capsule. So even if it is tilted, you can adjust your points of laser firing so that the uh, rexus that is produced is very, very regular. Uh, but Dr. Yo, I would just like to ask you, uh, looking at the uh, zone where dialysis was produced, would you not be interested to put in a segmental uh, ring segment in there? Because I thought the uh, dialysis was extending more than around two to three clock hours. So would you not uh, like to stabilize that equatorially by putting in a segment there? Dr. Yo? Not, not, not very clear. Yeah, I, I, I w w want to, uh, uh, I, I don't catch your comment and uh, you see the insertion that last, I just do a stitch for the stable. Yeah, you see of the cap, uh, cap uh, uh, and the hidden's larger. So I, I, I think the anterior chamber stable is very important. May I come in, May I have a privilege to comment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I would say that this surgery has been performed with the precision and the right decision has been taken by Professor Yo, and I must congratulate him for performing in such a beautiful manner. Flex has definitely helped us to handle with the complicated cases. Whether it is a high myopia, hard brown cataract, hypermature cataract, traumatic cataract, and when they do expand, the vitreous is also likely. In this case, the vexis was an advantage. Then you have not only the fragment, but you are softening the lens further. That is another advantage. As it is mentioned by Dr. Mishra, that you have a high definition OCT, which gives you the about the posterior capsular integrity, and you can titrate your energy requirement of the uh, posterior capsule 500 to 1000 micron on the other side where you are expecting zonulysis you can reduce the zone of uh, 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 in the any so i think have access, it's a beautiful tool for handling trauma cases and all other complicated cases thank you thank you thank you for a wonderful uh, case and uh, always a pleasure to be with you we are missing traveling, but uh, thank you and uh, thanks for uh, you. I hope you have a nice uh, afternoon and it is already going to be two o'clock in the afternoon for you. Thank you, Professor Yoke. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, next, I have the pleasure of introducing my another good friend, Professor, <coughs> Professor uh, uh, Ma Dr. Matt Wolfgang Schrader. So, Bebo stands for the Fellow of the European Board of Ophthalmology, born in Berlin in Germany. And he's also like a very old friend, 35 years experience, performed over 40,000 exclusive vitreous and retinal surgeries, including complicated VR surgeries of eye trauma, plus anterior segment surgeries, including more than 5,000 cataract surgeries, glaucoma, corneal, and lip surgeries, and has trained 15 vitreous retinal surgeons across the globe. Given more than 700 guest lectures, conducted more than 50 instruction courses, written more than 120 publications in journals, more than 10 chapters in books, live surgeries, post and organization of two international meetings on awkward trauma. We were all there for that trauma in the organization was birth. And a PhD thesis in spectrometry of the eye, ways to non-invasive diagnostic, fellow of the European Board of Ophthalmology, 
recipient of several international awards for his exemplary work uh, in history, German Revolution in 1848 and 1918, awarded by the President of Germany, Gustav Heinemann himself, in 1974 and 1975, and in the medical field of thermology, including Professor Orni, uh, Honorificum Senators of the Medical Faculty of the University of IRC in Romania in 2005, Mayor Shukrat Priest of the Jewish Diabetes Shaft in 2006, Helen Keller Medal for his work on ocular trauma at the AO in 2012, Silver and Gold Medal for his teaching efforts in Society of German Ophthalmic Surgeons and more, Residential Training, Senior Fellow and Consultant at the Department of Thermology, University of Freiburg, Germany 1995 to 2008, Consultant and Head of the Vitriatal Department at the Department of Thermology at University of Wilsburg, 2001 Associate Professor, 2010 Professor at this department, 2008 to 2014 Chairman at the Maximilian's Organ Clinic in Nuremberg since 2014 in current position. And more than that, he's also the uh, colleague in the International Society of Ocular Board. I stop sharing my and I request uh, Dr. to join us to do the presentation. Dear Nathayan, thank you very much for the intro introduction. Uh, first question: Do you have up? up uh, uh, do do you present my video, or sh shall I do it by myself? Are we presenting the video? Yes, you you uh, you can start the video now. Yes, uh, Rahul, do you have the video? Rahul and Lakshmi. Uh, or maybe you yes, can sir? play. Uh, you can play Doctor uh, Olga Shadows video. Hello, Rahul, play uh, Doctor Doctor Wolfans's video. Hello, Rahul. 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 Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Rahul, play Doctor uh, Wolfans video, please. Doctor. Doctor Shadows video. Doctor Shadows. Uh, Dr. Tariq Qureshi, kya? Well, if, if it's, if it's not possible, I, I have it in, in the backup. I okay. Others can do it. I don't know. I have a big chat in the folder that uh, no, no I have the video. Here is the video. Stop, uh, and I will uh, share the video. Okay, okay, fine. You can mute yourself. Your sounds up. Well, I just have to put in the monitor. Yeah, no problem. Um, Can 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 you see my my screen? Uh, no, no. I think, no. Sir, sir, can I play from my end? Can I play from my end, sir? Okay. I play from my end. Okay, play. It. Yes, sir. Yes, that, that's it. Okay, and it also has a uh, has a comment. You can also volume, volume, play the volume. No, no, volume is not coming. Stop your share, ma'am. I am going to start. Okay. Okay. Actually, you can stop sharing.
Rahul, there is a voice behind. Can you play the voice also? The crystalline lens did not show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. A 23-year-old male was mowing a lawn when he received an open globe injury. The anterior segment showed an irregular corneal wound, an iris incarceration and a temporal defect in the iris. The crystalline lens did not show any injury. Due to a vitreal hemorrhage, the posterior segment could not be inspected. The computer tomogram revealed an intraocular foreign body in the lower temporal periphery. As the patient was working in an agricultural setting, the risk of a traumatic endophthalmitis was higher. Therefore, it was decided to remove the intraocular foreign body within the first procedure of a wound closure followed by a pasplanar vitrectomy. Iris tissue has prolapsed. First, the paracentesis was performed. Closed with 10 O nylon sutures. To keep the pupil free of blood, more helon was injected. For the pasplanar vitrectomy, three sclerotomies were prepared. During the preparation, the eye became hypotonic, which was suspicious for a second perforation site. To save the crystalline lens, which was not yet injured, and to prevent the iatrogenic lens trauma during vitrectomy, a thorough anterior vitrectomy was performed, during which the pasplana and the peripheral retina was indented. During this procedure, a retinal defect was discovered in the temporal lower periphery as a hint for the second perforation site. The sclera was further inspected and a scleral perforation was found under the insertion of the inferior rectus muscle. The wound was closed with 7-0 vicryl sutures. A posterior vitrectomy was added using the biome and wide field lenses. The first goal of the posterior vitrectomy is to achieve a posterior vitreous detachment. Besides the first impact site of the intraocular foreign body near the insertion of the inferior rectus muscle, a second impact site was found nasal to the optic disc. The foreign body itself was found at a third site in the temporal periphery with another retinal defect there. The vitreous was removed around the intraocular foreign body. Before the intraocular foreign body was removed, the posterior pole was filled with perfluidicaline to prevent a macular damage if the foreign body would be lost during the removal. The intraocular foreign body was removed using Kuhn's endomagnet. The sclerotostomy had to be enlarged using blades and scissors. The foreign body could be extracted using the magnet and forceps. The injury was a double perforation with three retinal impact sites of the foreign body. The foreign body entered the eye via the cornea and iris, leaving the crystalline lens intact, but lacerated the sclera underneath the inferior rectus muscle and injured the retina nasal to the optic disc and finally hurt the retina in the temporal periphery. 
The sclerotomy that had to be enlarged for the foreign body removal was partially sutured. The further surgery was performed according to the suggestions of the International Trauma Trial. Complete anterior and posterior vitrectomy, including posterior vitreous detachment, clear all exit wounds from incarcerated vitreous, perform heavy diathermy and photocoagulation around exit wounds, leave one millimeter of sclera free of retina and chorate around the exit wounds, perform extensive photocoagulation around the exit wounds and a 360 degree equatorial laser retinopexy and an endotamponade with the gas or silicone oil. A one millimeter ring of retina and choroid is excised around the posterior impact sites. A broad photocoagulation ring is performed around these wounds and a 360 degree laser circlage is added circular on the equator. Photocoagulation of the posterior impact site nasal to the optic disc. Finally, closure of the conjunctiva, prophylactic antibiotics for three days, only little inflammation three days postoperatively. Peripheral fundus, few days postoperatively. In the meantime, a cataract developed, so the silicone oil removal after half a year was combined with cataract surgery. Visual Acuity was limited to 20 over 200, but is still improving and now only little impaired by a corneal astigmatism. It could be shown that a primary retractomy performed at the day of the injury could lead to a good anatomic and functional restitution. Complications as a difficult retinal detachment or tractions did not interfere with functional restitution. We believe that this is primarily due to an early surgery before complications such as a proliferative vitreo retinopathy or a complicated retinal detachment could develop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. Uh, can you, Rahul, can you sh stop sharing screen? Thank you, Rahul. I think a wonderful and complicated uh, uh, case, and I think uh, as usual. You take up all complicated surgeries, and I think uh, uh, we, uh, what is your experience in uh, eyes with no no perception of light with the trauma? Uh, uh, I didn't get to the last part of your question. No, in, in eyes when they present to you. With yeah. There's no option. Uh, then I would uh, perform an ultrasound uh, examine. And if I see any chance of uh, reconstruction, I would uh, try uh, all these eyes to, uh, to reconstruct. Uh, Professor Shader, just a question I would like to put through. Uh, that's a beautiful uh, point picked up, that is hypotony. Now, uh, we do get lots of agricultural injuries where uh, you could still have high femur, you could have no normal pupil size, but you still have got significant hypotony. Would you be interested, would you be going in to do full parotomy and uh, go ahead and look at, do the exploration, looking for the posterior uh, wounds, even though you have found on CT scan that everything is fine? Um, well, it, it, it just depends on the, on the history of, of the injury. <clears throat> If it's uh, supposed to be a foreign body injury, uh, then I would probably re, um, rely on, uh, on, on, on the CT scan. But if uh, I have any doubt and if there w could be another stitch injury or uh, injury by a stick or something else, 
uh, then I would uh, explore the square uh, and also explore the um, area of the square underneath the rectus muscles and even go behind the equator uh, for sure. exploring. Yeah, I, I agree because what happened is we do get lots of, because I'm in the agricultural area, we do get lots of blunt injuries mm -hmm. and we will get people with hypotony, though the CD scan has shown that the eye looks intact, the structurally it is fine, though there is still high FEMA. And as uh, Prof said that the, you can feel uh, uh, close to the insertions of the muscles, they could be small injuries. And sometimes we have to even detach muscle to look for any injuries. Right, right. That's very important. Um, about one third of uh, uh, ruptures are undetected before exploring. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Santosh Mahapatra. Do you have any comments? Dr. Asghar from Nigeria. The case uh, uh, is shown here is a definitely complicated case involving multiple <coughs> spiral tears, foreign body, and uh, multiple retinal, retinal uh, sites, injured retinal sites. Very nicely, uh, Sarah's uh, performed the surgery. And uh, the point I would like to tell that uh, to when we are removing such foreign bodies, it is very important to take care of the uh, lens uh, because it may injure uh, the lens while removing the foreign body through the sclerotomy because sometimes it is the posterior capsule is so bulged during trauma. So uh, I would like to have comments how to take care of the lens during removal of the foreign body. Uh, you, you saw in this case, I uh, used uh, Kuhn's endomagnet and it, it, it has a rounded tip on top of it. So uh, in, in this, uh, the, this endomagnet aligns the foreign body pretty, pretty nice. So it does not get uh, uh, other, uh, uh, in, in contrast to other um, uh, magnets which have a flat surface that the um, uh, foreign body aligns unfavorably and there's the risk of uh, cutting the capsule very much higher than with this Kuhn's magnet. Thank you. Dr. Asghar? Dr. Asghar, are you there? I can see you in the... So Dr. Asghar is a veterinary surgeon in... Dr. Asghar? Yes, sir. Uh, you have any comments on Dr. Professor Wolfgang shared as a video? Yes, sir. it's a wonderfully presented video. Uh, uh, intricate steps that he has uh, performed in uh, restoring the natural anatomy. Uh, it, it is to be seen that uh, in many patients, we have found uh, long term, uh, upon long term follow up, there are incidences of retinal detachments. So, do does he suggest that we use silicon oil in the first instance or gas, or uh, do we go in for a secondary procedure and use uh, oil and gas later, sir? I use the oil as a doctor. Gang used oil, and then when the patient developed cancer, it would Yes, and, 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 and the key to, uh, to avoid the secondary retinal detachments in such an amount, yeah. Uh, it is necessary to to cut out the rims uh, along the uh, perforation sites in the posterior part, so that you have no traction from the adjacent retina to the wound. Uh, we, we found out in this in international trauma trial. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a wonderful video, and thanks on a Sunday early morning in Germany. And uh, you, you. I know you have to go back to the hospital for a ROMs. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. Great pleasure to have you. Have a nice day. I enjoyed yeah. being with you. Meeting each other because yeah. we didn't have, but I hope to meet you sometime. Thank you. Yes, I hope to too. Goodbye. Bye. 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 So thank you, Dr. Asghar, for joining from thank Uganda. You so. you, yes, do you thank you. Do you like this in Uganda? Yes, sir. Actually, uh, in Africa, we see a lot of trauma cases, especially in Western Africa. Uh, a lot of uh, gunshot injuries and explosion injuries, blast injuries, basically. So polytrauma is a very common occurrence in uh, 
riot prone areas sir. so we have come across a lot of cases uh question to dr natarajan can i oh, yes sanjeev yes sanjeev yes sanjeev can you uh, sanjeev yes uh you said that you like to put a, you said that you you normally put silicon oils in the intraocular foreign bodies with detachment or with samurai uh, detachment sorry so uh, yes. you also uh, made a comment that you remove the oil when the cataract surgery is being done so i just want to know that these kind of cases where the retina is already weak would you like to leave the oil for some more time because ideally you normally remove after 3 4 months so uh, would you like to leave the oil for some more time after the cataract surgery so that their chances of redetachment or going into hypotesis a little less yeah i think it it varies from patient to patient one is if the primary surgery is done very well there as sort of rule games mentioned there is no traction nothing seen in the area of scar and there is no reproliferation may be happening then in that i think we remove the eyes remove the silicon oil but if you feel that uh, in case the attraction is not really well and there is a risk of detachment then we leave the oil for some time but many times when the cataract is there maybe there is a silicon oil emulsification so i think i remove the oil and if i feel that sometimes on the table you may see a detachment happening and i use 5000 centi strokes as a remove up removing the oil making sure removing all the membranes and use 5000 for a long term tap okay thank you i would like to add sanjeev yes. i would like to add here that yes. silicon oil you have to balance the removal of silicon oil because it may lead to the glaucoma as such the post vitrectomy in trauma cases glaucoma is very common and a long term uh, uh, the silicon oil if it is more than 4 months or so this possibility goes very high because i have seen that the silicon oil it just pent this uh, angle of anterior chamber like a, you have a, a road which is uh, made by the crystal glass so this is the one reason then the corneal decompensation may also take place the word about hypotony as we have been discussing other than leaking wound or uh, hidden uh, tear choroidal effusion other than that the ciliary shock because of trauma and subsequent surgery is uh, second reason to have a persistent uh, choroidal uh, this uh, changes and hypotony so that we have to manage if you are using silicon oil probably these changes what happens because of ciliary shock are avoided so i would uh, definitely go with uh, dr natarajan because i know if you go with him you are always in a fair side to mm-hmm. continue with the silicon oil <laughs> but removal and second thing about the cataract i prefer to remove uh, on the same sitting rather than waiting for developing cataract because multiple surgeries will lead to the corneal endothelial damage also but so the question was that if the patient hasn't developed cataract so there is no point removing the lens that was my question that was like developing a cataract in a second stage so that was 80% the- of the vitrectomy will develop cataract if the patient is 50 plus or so i think it is better to remove it even if the patient doesn't has a cataract it may happen after you have developed after fortnight or one month it is better we explain to it in fact in all glaucoma cases above 50 55 i always tell them the results of combined surgery is much better than doing only single surgery sanjeev if i say within one year after a vitrectomy 70% of them tend to develop cataract and in a setting of a trauma this is incidence is quite earlier and so if you are planning a second procedure like silicon oil removal you would see some form of cataract which comes in the way of your surgery and further follow up so to avoid second procedure this would be more prudent an approach but it can be clubbed with the silicon oil removal plus cataract exactly exactly thank you so much thank you, uh, thank you dr olgan and can i request now dr subudhi to introduce the next speaker that is dr viswajit de yes so again <clears throat> i have the pleasure to introduce one of the young and dynamic uh, surgeon from odisha dr viswajit de of course he was my student also in mbbs Uh, at present, he is working as a consultant, cataract and periodic ophthalmology and squints. He is the medical director, modern eye care, Katak, Odisha, and also medical director, Sai Nepal, Chandigarh, Odisha. He is a very versatile surgeon. 
He is a uh, he did his DNB from Susutai Foundation, Kolkata, and fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology with Arvind Aspen Pondicherry. Since then, he is practicing Pune Shatak for the last 10-15 years. A very dynamic surgeon. I introduced him to this uh, webinar to say something about the good about the ocular trauma in pediatric age group. So thank you. Welcome, Dr. Bishwajit. Good morning, sir. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, sir. I would like to share uh, my presentation right away. So, uh, I'll be talking about uh, managing a traumatic pediatric attack. This is a young uh, three-year-old child who has a history of trauma. And he has developed an uh, observed cataract. Uh, so we are not very sure about the zonal status. So I prefer uh, a scleroconial uh, incision instead of clear corneal incision. So that uh, if any... Uh, Mr. Jeff, we can't see your video. We cannot see your video. Please play it. Uh, it's not visible video? Not coming. No. You stop your screen share, open the video, minimize it, and then start screen sharing. Okay. Sir, may I share from my end? Uh, you can do that. You can do that. You Is stop it sharing. visible now? Is it visible now? No, 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 no. Rahul, you please share number, number eight. Number eight. Number eight. Number eight. Video number eight. Video number eight. Yes. Yes. Now. It is visible. It is visible. Yes. It is visible. Yes. It is visible. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it is a three-year. Uh, so it is a three-year-old. Old child who injected orthopedic cataract. Orthopedic cataract. Mr. Rahul, please, Mr. Rahul, mute, please mute yourself. We are getting an echo. Echo. Okay. So, so, okay. so, so the absorbed is not very sure of the uh, jonular status. This is recorded during my tenure in Arvind Eye Hospital. So, um, we, I planned a scleroconial tunnel. And um, scleroconial tunnel gives me a, a freedom to go for any other uh, CTR and all if it is at all required. So uh, I'm planning a, a multi-piece IOL in this patient uh, because uh, if any zonular weakness is there, it will be much stable. So uh, first step would be to do a proper uh, rexis. Uh, as you can see from 6 o'clock to 3 o'clock, there is a calcific anterior capsule. So, Rexis, I am making it uh, slightly smaller so that I can complete yeah. the Rexis. After uh, yes. completing the uh, Rexis, I, I would remove the cortex. Uh, right, right. I have, I am ready. Minimal right. cortex, whichever is. Yeah, I have the slide. There. I have the slide. Rahul, mute. So, after removing the cortex, I can see there is a thick posterior uh, leg which uh, is not coming out. So now I'm planning that I'll uh, put the uh, I will uh, next so that uh, after putting the I will uh, once it is stable, I'll plan to remove the posterior plaque under the uh, scaffold of the lens. So now I have put the lens in the bag. Now uh, I'll uh, take that uh, calcified portion of the anterior capsule. Uh, this uh, anterior capsule have to uh, give a, a manual nick on both the sides of the capsule which is calcified and try to complete a little bigger axis since I know now the lens is uh, well sitting inside the bag. Now I can remove the anterior part of that uh, uh, capsule. Now the next thing is to remove that posterior plaque which is very thick and adherent. Uh, I'll just gently pull from one side, uh, mostly it comes out if we pull it gently. After uh, removing the plaque in total, I can see there is some thinning of the posterior capsule in the center, but there is no bridge yet. So I'll, uh, most of, mostly the uh, traumatic attack go for fibrous PCO, so 
primary uh, PPC and uh, vitrectomy is very essential in pediatric cataract. Goes for uh, fibrous capsule, it is reached the level. Uh, now I'll perform the anterior vitrectomy and I'll remove the visco and at the end uh, I have to suture the wound uh, well. And in this case, the lens is well sitting inside the back, and I'll close the conjecture. I completed the case uh, without any journalers uh, dissents. Thank you. Uh, Mehul, you like to comment? Thank you, Dr. Biswajit. Dr. Mehul? Dr. Mehul, any comments or? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I still don't understand uh, why did you choose a sclerocornial approach for this case, Mr. Jit. I think uh, the last part of your uh, surgery, which uh, showed us the vitrectomy being done, I, I'm sure that's a pavement vitrector, which is a very thick probe. But otherwise, with the vitrectors that we use nowadays with the 23 or a 25 gauge, I don't think uh, you need a sclerocornial uh, section for that at all. Because you're using a foldable lens any which way. Uh, all that would be done in a closed chamber if you do the vitrectomy from the side ports and in a bimanual manner. And in fact, uh, I would also like to use a micro rexus forceps, in this case, micro grabbers, which can easily go through the side port so that you have a loose, uh, you have a solidly formed anterior chamber all the while we are doing, while you're doing the procedures inside the AC. But rest of it was wonderful. I think the, the way you removed that plaque was really good. It also gives you an opportunity to uh, capture the optic posteriorly behind the posterior capsule should be anterior capsule not be integral. Everything else is very nicely managed. But I would still say that I would uh, perhaps uh, use the limbal approach much more than uh, a sclerocornial approach for cases like this. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. And uh, we'll go to the next sir. speaker. Yes. Sir, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. A adding, adding to Dr. Anurag, sir, my comment is, uh, Yes, uh, what Dr. Anurag told, uh, that is one point. My second point is, if you see the picture of the boy, the two eye, the right eye looks, I think in size it is small. And it is like posterior plaque cataract. So, although there, is, there may be the history of trauma, but if we, we should think about one eye patient, one eye small eye, having the posterior plaque like cataract, the PHV should be rolled out. That is another point. Other point is, uh, apart from the doing the uh, the posterior axis, the removing the plaque after putting the IOL, why not uh, before putting the IOL? It can be easily done before putting uh, putting the IOL. First, you uh, remove the the capsule, posterior capsule, beautifully, and do the anterior vitrectomy, and you can put IOL in this because no, otherwise you're at, yeah. yeah. At times, it is difficult if you open the posterior capsule first, despite of the vitrectomy being neatly done. It is sometimes difficult to find the cleavage plane between the anterior and the posterior capsules and create a bag for putting in the eye well. So, uh, what you know. uh, what is what was done in this case was quite appropriate. I mean, you can always have the option of doing the other way around, yeah. as you're suggesting. But in a traumatic no, no. cataract, which is uh, which is partially absorbed, uh, it's always better to put in the eye well, stretch the bag. Ensure its proper location and then proceed with the posterior capsule procedures. Yeah. I, I always do it this way, so uh, I fully. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, myself, I would prefer to go through a limb uh, pass plana and do a nice uh, posterior capsulotomy with the help of a cutter. It would be more controlled with, uh, and uh, you don't have to go through a bigger section. So, which is cutter yeah, uh, is a good option if you go through pass plana. Absolutely right, sir. But, uh, you know, a lot of those cases do not actually involve the posterior capsule. As you saw in here, it was a plaque which was sitting over the posterior capsule, which could be peeled off. So the posterior capsule was not involved. And then depending on the age of the patient and other factors, you can choose whether to open the posterior capsule or not at the first place. If the fixation is proper, if the child is so, old, 14 years or so, you might choose not to open the posterior capsule at all. Uh, it will be the vitreal axis, which will be much properly say. Yeah, what do you say? Uh, sir, it, it, uh, in, it will be a vitreal axis. Okay. Okay. capsule, you make perfect round and capture the lens. Uh, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Puran will say he is more experienced. Yes, sir, that was just saying. 
after removing your anterior capsule if you are doubt that you can with the vitreous cutter vitreotomy cutter you can cut surround cut, cut around the rexis and put the eyewell uh, appropriately that is my uh, recommendation otherwise the nice so solution what we are suggesting this you have, you have to go from back past lana cut round and then insert the lens in the sulcus and capture the lens okay thank you thank you very much dr day and uh, now i uh, go to the next uh, speaker so i'll share the screen so we have uh, my friend uh, dr johan hutat uh, i was with him uh, that was my last trip abroad which was on february ऑफ <laughs> veteran surgeon and uh, i inaugurated the uh, first ocular trauma center at jakarta eye center in february 7 dr rutat was also the president of the indonesian cornea society and the vice president of the indonesian ophthalmology association and the other the padami and the past president of the indonesian society of cataract and refractive surgery so over to you uh, uh, dr johan you can share your screen or uh, lakshmi Uh, Rahul is showing the video. Okay, Johan. Thank you, Johan. Johan has to show the video, sir. He is showing. He is showing. Okay. Thank you, Prasnati. Uh, yes. Greetings from Jakarta, Indonesia, and a very good. morning to all our friends from odisha state of tamilical society i would like to share my topics about management of traumatic subluxated lens so by definition <coughs> subluxated is when the lens is displaced from its normal position but it remains in the pupillary area if you say luxated or dislocated if it is completely displaced from the pupil but for ectopia lentis is the term used to describe only for this congenital dislocations for patients like this traumatic uh, subluxated lens we have to do pre operative examinations a complete one with slit lamp and dilated and dilated pupil and you have to take notes about the, the degree of subluxation and the density of the nucleus and also a thorough retinal examinations us ultrasound be scanned in supine position because the lens position may change in sitting and supine positions and also other ocular abnormalities usually the presence of vitreous in the anterior chamber any uveitis glaucoma or gonioscopy if necessary for the surgical plans my uh, choice is to give and say 3 days prior to surgery this will help to maximize pupil dilatation reduce inflammations and maintain pupil dilations during surgery also if you found any intraocular pressure you have to give azathioprine at least one day pre op and the surgical plans we have in hand the high viscosity ovd tripen blue for capsular staining and ctr also myogen ring because sometimes the pupil cannot be dilated vitrectomy and bimanual ia also readily available and always ready for plan b at least you uh, put also in your uh, anterior chamber iol i prefer artisan rather than to suture the iol because it takes longer time this is the capsular tension ring that we have to provide according to the degree of the luxations usually uh, i use from optech my preference is like this to explain to my patients if the degree of subluxation is less than 4 hours i use standard ctr and the three piece iol if 4 to 7 clock hours i use sionering with single piece 
as more than eight clock hours, I prefer to do lensectomy and iris clip anterior chamber IOL uh, rather than the scleral fixations. And then the timing for CTR insertion is, uh, in my uh, experience, I would implant as late as you can, but as early as you must. Because CTR is easier to implant if the back is empty. So if you try to insert the CTR while starting to do surgery, I think it will be more difficult. So this is the case of 41 female, decrease of vision within one year of, with history of trauma. The visual acuity of right eye is 0 0.1, which is six meters finger counting. And then the left eye is uh, normal. I perform ultrasound examinations. The retina is good. And for the UBM, there is a all quadrants. So the surgery, I prefer to do uh, with flex with this uh, condition because there is a pre-existing corneal astigmatism. So I program to do the arcuate incisions and this uh, with flex, I do the grid pattern with 250 microns to make the lens softer because it, this is 41 years old. At least we can go with the very slow motion FACO to reduce the risk of uh, zonular dehiscence in, the, in this already compromised eye. For the FACO investigations, uh, after the second this is the video, uh, we can enlarge the pupil with uh, intracameral uh, epinephrine and use vision blue or uh, and then you you can see that the capsulosis is very easy to do with the flex and just remove it with the uh, capsular forceps and this is done with a very low uh, FACO mystifications because we don't want to do uh, any other harm to the already relaxed journals. And then after removing the, the cataract, I still try to do bimanual IA in the, uh, not in the legs area first, in the intact journals first. Because if you start in the, in the journal dehiscence area, will, you will have a chance to make the journal dehiscence greater. And if you have encountered some problems in here, I think it's better to stop doing the, the IA and start uh, inserting the uh, CTR into the back. I usually use only with the Sinsky hook and the other with the uh, capsular uh, forceps or you can use also the Kublen hook. And after that, I use a three-piece IOL to add tensions to this uh, legs zonal due to traumatic uh, uh, origin. So we just, that's why I use only the flex because it's very difficult to orient it if you use toric IOL for this kind of situations. It's better to use arcuate incision uh, using the flex. If you don't have flex for subluxated lens, it will be early, uh, another challenge to create a circular capsulorexis because the zonal is very lax and the, the, the lens is usually moving around. So to start, you have to make a, a short, a, and then using a second hand you, and Sinsky hook to push to the opposite directions while you are trying to uh, use capsular forceps to make the <laughs> capsular axis. Usually for traumatic cataract, the lens is not very hard. So you can even use only the uh, very low power. And then 
In this case, I only use like uh, aspiration rate only 30. And then because the zonal is uh, uh, almost three clock hours, I still can use the CTR prior to do the irrigations and aspirations. And then after that, you can continue as usual using the irrigation aspirations with uh, IA tip. But for the zonal, in the area of zonal laxity, I think it's better to use the Bimanuel IA. And then I still use the three piece and oriented this three piece strands to add another tension to the capsule tension ring that already implanted earlier. I think that is uh, for my six minutes presentations and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Johan. Uh, Dr. Mehul, do you have any comments? Uh, in first case, uh, that could have been done without any CTR support. Your presentation and uh, surgery recording were wonderful. The second case was done excellent. And uh, I think you don't need to do anything else. What you have done is a, a great job. Thank you. Uh, can I say one thing, Dr. Natarajan? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, wonderfully yes. managed uh, cases, both the cases. I was uh, looking at uh, that uh, the why the people was not dilated for the for the flex different. I was not um, because the people was small and we have made a small capsular axis in the first case with the femtosecond laser. If it, if the the pupil is too small, I think we cannot do with the femtosecond laser with the flex. I prefer to do it with the other laser, which we can do it intraoperatively, intracameral injections before the laser using the Zima Z8. Because with the flex, we cannot open the antral chamber, but with the Zima, because in the same settings in the operating theater, not in the other room, I still can use intracameral uh, epinephrine to dilate the pupil. Okay. Um, and the uh, thing is that uh, we should uh, form the chamber while removing the, by with the help of viscoelastic before we remove the side port or main uh, FACO uh, tip or the IA tip. Uh, that will help um, the, that will prevent the extension of the ex existing zonal dialysis further. The subluxation can, and the vitreous prolapse should not be there in the interior chamber. So uh, that is very important to be to be kept in mind. But in both the cases, uh, we have not filled the chamber with viscoelastic from the side port and uh, filled the chamber bag. And one more thing is that uh, I always fill the capsular bag with the viscoelastic before implanting the CTR. That also helps and it distends the bag and the chances of damage to the bag and uh, extension of the zonal dialysis is prevented. Otherwise, it's very nicely man managed cases. And the videos were a lot of clarity was there in the video. Very good quality videos. Thank you. I think his uh, capsular bags also behave very obediently, sir. Because uh, without using the capsular hooks, also he was able to perform PECO. Yeah. And we could not see anywhere the collapse, the collapse of the capsular bag and uh, its attempt to get engaged in the PECO tip. So very obedient behavior by the capsule. He was lucky. Uh, but yeah, I mean, excellently managed cases and uh, 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 about putting in the CTR in the end, um, when the bag is totally empty and you do not have any nuclear support, I always prefer to do it by manual, you know, uh, enter the CTR with one hand and support it with the other hand with the same skill, same key instrument, because what happens is sometimes if there is, yeah. So, uh, very nice. Can we move on? Yes, certainly, sir. Uh, Rahul, uh, can you please share my screen, please? Uh, Dr. Opi Agrawal, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm ready. Thank you, Dr. Johan, for uh, taking part in our... Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rahul, please, uh, can you share my screen so that I can introduce you? Rahul, one second. Rahul, Rahul. Can you share yes, my screen first? Rahul, I will share the introduction slide first. 
Can you share my screen so that I can read? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Agrawal. He is founder of Rohit Eye Hospital and Child Care Center and founder member of Indoor Lacy Eye Center. President of Indoor Ophthalmic Society and performed many live surgeries. He achieved many awards in uh, Madhya Pradesh state, including MP State Ophthalmic Society and uh, Sadhguru Netra Chikitsalai Award. As an accomplishment, he has performed more than 40,000 tracho surgeries and n number of uh, other surgeries, including SICL, DCR, Terrigem, and LASIK surgeries. He is our neighbor, he is from Indore. Thank you. Can you go ahead, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, Rahul, you can share number 10, Dr. Agarwal's video. Good morning. Thanks for kind words. I am going to present the post-traumatic canalicular uh, uh, laceration repair. This is a 14 years old boy having a trauma injury, and uh, there is a canalicular laceration which I have repaired. First, we have to clean the wound. We, we should identify the nasal uh, proximity of uh, canaliculus, which we can uh, find out it should be in a pale circumscribed uh, circular opening. If this is visible, we feel that we and uh, patient is very lucky. So this I have repaired with the help of uh, silicon stand. The, after dilatation of punctum, the silicon stand is uh, passed and the <clears throat> nasal proximity of uh, uh, canalicula is uh, identified and then silicon stent is introduced. Uh, it is very nicely visible uh, nasal proximity of uh, non uh, canaliculi and here a silicon tube is introduced properly. The posterior layer of the uh, full thickness lid here is first repaired and we have to uh, see that no suture knot should be towards the conjunctival side. This is all repaired uh, inside so that there is no irritation on the cornea uh, afterwards. So this is all first the posterior layer of the lid uh, tear is repaired uh, uh, meticulously and after that, after uh, <clears throat> this silicon stent is introduced in the uh, nasal proximity of canaliculi, this anterior yes, uh, skin layers are sutured. All the orbicular muscles should be repaired properly and this uh, silicon intubation will give the excellent results. To find out uh, nasal proximity is very difficult, but in this patient, it was quite uh, easily visible and was able to uh, repair it properly. This silicon tube is uh, sutured on skin surface properly so that it should not come out any time. We should at least keep it for two to three weeks. This is make bed slightly uh, loose so that it should not irritate the punctum and it should not cause any harm to uh, punctum. This is all repaired. This is post-operatively after three weeks. Uh, we even not able to find out any suture marks or anything. It's very clearly visible. The lid margins, the lid is uh, uh, repaired nicely. And we can see how beautifully we can able to uh, see this canaliculi. Uh, this is the punctum. <clears throat> With first syringing, it was patent. We can pass full uh, cannula through the punctum. So this is what if we uh, 
can do this type of repair in uh, all our trauma cases in i we can get very good results here patience and meticulous repair is needed thank you thank you very much thank you dr agarwal dr sanjeev mohan can you make a quick comment before i go to the next speaker and professor chul you are the next speaker sanjeev are you there yeah, already hear me yes uh yes uh Uh, can i make a comment in this yeah uh, i actually a uh, beautiful talk uh, uh, dr agarwal uh, actually the place where we live we have got lots of pet injuries dog bites yes and tra- trauma from the sports injury you know uh, footy and rugby soccer and we get this canalicular rupture very commonly so uh, uh, we tend to use mini monica and uh, we leave that uh, so that uh, punct- that stays the tubing stays in the punctum lower punctum and we leave that for almost 3 to 6 uh, months and, and I, as you said like uh, suturing the posterior lip first and then the anterior and obviously we have to be very careful because the uh, temporal uh, movement or laxity can happen uh, so suturing has to be done very but it was a beautiful case uh presented uh with excellent results thank you very much how soon it should be repaired how soon it should be repaired is there a delay that is what the problem uh, this this uh, child came after 6 uh, hours of gen- uh, injury yeah. and we have repaired uh, as early as possible but if we we'll delay this repair then they are going me to i they got me so to see that Ε, ε, πούστι μου, φέρε τον καφέ, έχω να πει τίποτα. Okay, please, please, just continue. Because there will be more chances of uh, retraction of this nasal end of uh, canalicular and to find out to uh, search that canalicular, canalicular end will be very difficult. Yes, so sometimes we have to get a general anesthesia, take some time, sometimes you may lose some time. Yeah. So this was a young child, 14 years old. So we did not, didn't give any anesthesia. It was all under local anesthesia. We can able to do it. Right. But Dr. Agarwal, you said uh, this was three weeks post-op, and we could not see the stent. When did you remove yeah, it? Yeah, this was this was this was removed automatically after three weeks. We were we we were uh, tried uh, that we should keep it for longer duration, but it was removed automatically. Uh, then we remove that uh, suture and remove the uh, silicon tubing. No, but, but fortunately, we got that, very good results. That yeah. stent was there for 14 days. No, but so the, the stent extrusion. that you are putting in, the stent that we saw you putting in, does it have a foot plate which uh, which sticks to the pumpkin and and stays I'm like the monocar or the? It was remained for 14 days. After after 14 days, it was uh, removed automatically, and then we saw. and we did uh, syringing and everything but till that so, time it was yeah so it you does have a fixation it. point oh yeah, you yeah. sutured it oh. yeah we sutured it outside yeah that is there in video also so, so, yeah, I, i think the key to your success was the posterior suture that you were mentioning just a little while earlier uh, at times surgeons actually forget to put the posterior uh, posterior sutures you know if there is no proper opposition between the canaliculi the pericanaliculi suturing is not proper and if they are not uh, okay. perfectly opposed then uh, yes. this stent is likely to be extruded so it's very important that anatomically they come together and there's no space for the tube to get extruded yeah yes thank you dr agarwal for a wonderful case and discussion dr alok you wanted to say something yeah i think uh, i think as uh, uh, dr agarwal was saying locating the distal opening that is the big uh, crunch and many times we just even have to use the fluorescein and um, uh, yeah. and third thing is i think uh, probably there is a lecture coming up later the pig pigtail probe pig is still yeah. something which is very very good to use but uh, that, that many of the times about... that use lot of trauma and is very difficult to use that pigtail uh, probe yeah also. it has a very steep that learning is... curve the pigtail yeah 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 and that's why i have mentioned that i am lucky and patient is also lucky that it is uh, a clearly visible uh, nasal end of uh, lacerated canalicular
Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you very much. Sir, sir Agrawal, sir. Yeah. So my question is, it is yes. you are lucky to get the both the end of the canaliculi beautifully uh, visible, but sometimes there are edema. It's what Dr. Subhut sir was asking the timing of the doing the surgery. Yes. Whether we should wait for two to three days to uh, reduce the edema to find the proper uh, uh, orientation, the proper lining of the canal. Otherwise, the people make false passages. Or if more late, then then maybe retraction. So, what is the ideal time? Can you tell? Me? So, if patient reported early, as in my case, uh, the patient reported after six hours of uh, injury, and we. Took the patient immediately in the operation theater and prepare it. So that time is good. But if patient comes uh, after 24 to 48 hours, then we have to first evaluate the case whether we should go immediately or uh, after some times. In few of our cases in uh, lit tear and uh, ocular trauma, what we have used is uh, adrenaline. The adrenaline apple is just put into the uh, saline and we soaked it. Uh, and we kept it pressed for a few minutes and we, we, we will find that absolutely there will be very less edema that reduces uh, like anything. This is what okay, we have to thank you of our uh, uh, other uh, lead surgeries. Okay, sir. Uh, nice so, interview. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal and thank you all the There comments. is very innovative technique in which the reverse end of uh, four zero proline after making blunt, if you insert and then uh, take it out from both ends and then tie the proline itself will remain at the stand and it will it will last for one month or so then you can remove without doing anything sir if we really want to do something uh, good for the patients if we are not able to find out the nasal end of uh, lacerated mm -hmm. uh, lacrimal cannula uh, uh, canaliculi then what we can do uh, what we are regularly doing with uh, ENT surgeon endonasal DCR. At the same time, we can uh, ask our uh, ENT surgeon to associate with us. We can do uh, endonasal DCR. We can find out the uh, 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 that uh, opening in the sac, and from that opening, we can uh, insert uh, silicon tubes. It is retro insertion of the silicon tube. We have tried. We have tried in one of our patient. We were not very uh, confident at that time, and we will not be able to do that. But that is the procedure which we can uh, work out, and someone can do this type of procedure, and we can find very good results. This is what we have done only in one patient, but we were not successful in that patient. So that is a technique which, with the help of ENT surgeon, we can do it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Agarwal, and I take the opportunity to welcome Dr. My friend uh, Thanasis Nikolakopoulos from Greece. But I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, the next speaker. Uh, my friend, uh, Professor Chul Young Choi from Seoul, Korea. He's a professor and director, Department of Ophthalmology, Kang Book Samsung Hospital, Sung mm -hmm. University, and a council member of Korean Ophthalmic Society. Korean Society of Cataracts and Refractive Surgery, Korea Cornea Society, board member of APSRS, and regional managing editor, I World Asia Pacific Korean Edition. Thank you, Professor Chul. You have stopped sharing. You can share the screen. Thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. And can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. And um, can you see my slides here? We can see the slides. You can, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I will start. And, and today I would like to talk about um, the method to how we can manage the iris to, for perplexing the pupil. This is his slide. Uh, we know well about the, what is the principles of iris repair. We need to minimize the further damage and to preserve as much iris tissues as possible. I brought this slide because I made uh, some mistake during my cases in this point. And usually, and as a beautiful slide, uh, previously uh, Dr. Uh, Pariha uh, delivered before, like uh, when we deal the uh, polyocular trauma, we use it like this method to repair the iridodialysis up internal from inside to outside. 
And from 2006, uh, I re when I, after reading uh, this uh, article uh, from uh, Dr. Richard, simple repairing method as a socialist technique, only we need it to pull out the periphery irises from the inside to outside, and that's all. The only need thing is a uh, micro vitroretinal pulse and a sclerotomy side, that's all. So here we can see the uh, some cases. This is the first uh, small and uh, iridialysis we can see here, and uh, one and two and our clockwise uh, the dialysis can be easily repaired by grab the peripheral irises after the cataract and plow the irises here, and that's all. But I and I prefer to make an additional suture to guarantee the uh, stability of the bone. And this is the post of slide is quite easily we can repair without any suture. So uh, this is a little bit in the wider wound that we can see here. It is about as you say, it's around in the, in three or four clockwise is wide. But also we can do that the similar same method as the before cataract surgeries. And then we can see the much wider, safer with the sizes to do the cataract. And uh, all the way to one is in grab, and we can see that much beautiful the iris is after the surgery. This is much more complicated to why the hydrodialysis cases. Uh, we observe the no more and the pathology in the posterior part. Uh, we decide which uh, approach from the anterior part to deliver the lenses here. And it was actually in uh, 10 years before uh, when I was a junior staff, a so the physician staff. And so I uh, struggled to manage the, the lenses without any posterior port to me. So I used the uh, spoon to deliver the entire lenses from the wound in the superior part, and I detracted me from anterior port. So during and the vitrectomy, mm, I made some mistake. Here we can see. Oops, yes. I laid up the uh, bridges of the remain the part of the iris. So, uh, so surprised to see the, and I decided to repair it again. And, uh, because, and then uh, I spent an additional hour to repair the iris, the bridges. And, and then after using a similar method as the previous slide, I repaired from the outside and the, yeah, it was the dialysis and three pointed. And scar fixations was done, and additional pupillar plastic to make a right size of a pupil. And I could finish up the uh, surgeries around two and a half hours later. Okay, this is the post op slide. Uh, finally, we should uh, minimize the, the further damage and preserve as much as tissues as we can. We can. That's all my slides would say. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Chul. I think wonderful presentation. Anybody have, Purindra, want to make a quick comment? Only we are a little late, but I want a thumb. Purindra? I have a doubt. Hello, Purindra? Doubt. Yeah, who's speaking? Yeah, this is Dr. Aishwarya. I have a doubt. Yeah, you can ask. Yes, yes. Uh, excellent presentation. I've never done this technique. Uh, what is the incidence of infection after this? Since we are going to put a insert a portion of the iris in the scleral uh, tunnel, so have you any comments on the rate of infections or post of inflammation? Yeah, we can think about that, but I we, I don't have any experience with uh, in a, like an infection or other the complications because we cover by the healthy conjunctiva and the tissues and over that, and so I don't think of. Uh, 
I don't have any experience like uh, at the company. Um, but in such uh, a large, uh, wide-based uh, iridodialysis where the uh, iris segment hangs in the middle like a seat belt, wouldn't be uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to support the iris with iris hooks, maybe two or three, so that your business area is iris-free? Because this tissue is actually floating and it can get caught in the vitrectomy probe or in the phaco probe, whatever you're doing. So wouldn't it be a good idea to just support it? I mean, stretch it and retract it peripherally with the iris hook. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely, it is correct. Yes, if it is, uh, yeah. Uh, is, uh, Professor Choi, uh, uh, will it not be uh, a broad thing which is coming out so that uh, there, there is a peaking of people in that direction? Because a yes, wide area of uh, iris tissue, a broad area of iris tissue is being brought out and uh, uh, that is what it is. But if you suture it, then you are, uh, I mean, not having that bright, uh, broad, wide uh, base of iris which is there. Chances yes, of uh, yes. peaking of people is more. You're right. Uh, yeah. Previously, I have a one case is uh, like an, a peaking an iris from the uh, suturing site. So I, we can control the, the iris is a little bit, and, and also iris is a very soft and reluctant tissues. So don't worry about uh, the uh, peaking of iris is pupil. So uh, you you can have a very nice and um, Richard without any fearing about uh, a peaking of pupil. I think. Uh, uh, can I please comment one? Uh, actually, yeah, uh, it's very encouraging, Dr. Choi, to listen to your talk because uh, inadvertently, when I was visiting East Timor, which is uh, north of Australia, I go there to teach. And so we had some visiting students with a, a similar problem, and they happened to cause the aerodialysis of about more than 180 degrees. Yeah. And with no facilities there, I didn't have any choice what to do. So I practically did seven, eight openings like yourself, you did, and I yeah. sutured it. And strangely enough, the uh, anatomical result was very, very good, just like you show. But I couldn't follow up the patient for a long time and I'm not sure what happened in terms of glaucoma and everything. Excellent, Thank you. Nice, excellent technique. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your comment. And actually, it was the case of a ten years ago. So uh, I ha I'm looking at that patient till now, and no more other complication was observed. There. It was very lucky without any glaucoma or other pathology on the posterior. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor, for joining from Korea. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank see you. you. Thank you. I hope to see you soon. Yes, and hope. All the best for organizing the next APA series. In, uh, Thank you. Yeah. So now I have the opportunity to introduce uh, my fellow and uh, who is now practicing in uh, Uganda, Dr. Syed Agaruzin. He is uh, pr presently working as a senior consultant in charge of Dr. Agarwal's Eye Hospital, Kampala, Uganda. He also visits multiple African countries, Nigeria, Tanzania, Rwanda. Madagascar. He has uh, 18 years experience. He is a senior veterinary surgeon trained by me in Jyot in Mumbai. And he worked as a senior consultant in Vasan and earlier also worked in SRM and uh, also international editor of the International Journal of Edit uh, Retina, a formal assistant editor of the Journal of Tamil Nadu of Sunday Association. And uh, here you can share your screen. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. I would request uh, the organizers to play my video, sir. Uh, uh, Rahul, yeah. number 12. Rahul, Thank number you for 12. The, yes. You're looking a uh, smart uh, side. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the beautiful introduction, sir. All, with all your blessings. Rahul? Yes, ma'am. Wait, ma'am. Yeah, number 12. Nice to see my friend Thanasis in the. He was uh, speaking in the afternoon, but uh, from Greece he's here. Welcome, Thanasis. If uh, if you can hear me now. Yes. May I start? Yes, you can start. 
Okay. Uh, so this is a case of a blunt trauma wherein a 60 year old uh, individual had sustained an injury and uh, we found that his entire uh, intraocular lens capsular plaque complex had dislocated. And uh, we started off the, so the video is going a bit fast. We started off the procedure with uh, initial marking using the glue diol marker, which is designed by Dr. Ashwin Agarwal and it's marketed by Epsilon. So um, following uh, limbal cautery, spheral flaps were taken and a 20 gauge needle was uh, used to make the sclerotomy. Following this, a uh, vitrectomy was performed and uh, using PFCL levitation. Sir, kaisa laga, sir? <laughs> चेम्बर At this point, I realized that only the capsular tension ring was uh, seen in the chamber. Ah, yes, ma'am. So this was a surprise uh, entity that we came across. So first, I removed the capsular tension ring through a small paracentesis. Following this, the foldable intraocular lens that was dislocated was also extracted. I made a corneal spiral uh, tunnel and I had to remove the intraocular lens. Of course, we had the option of uh, cutting the intraocular lens within the chamber itself. But since I was using a three piece rigid uh, lens later on, I had to make a small uh, spiral incision. Now, one point to be noted here is once the one of uh, once the leading haptic was externalized, I used the iris uh, hook uh, retention uh, retainer to hold the uh, haptic in place. Then the trailing haptic was also externalized, and using a 26 gauge bent needle, a small pouch was created wherein the haptic was inserted. So both the leading and trailing haptics were inserted into the scleral tunnel. So Chariot's pouch is what is very important here as described by uh, Dr. Chariot. Following this, uh, the scleral lip was sutured and uh, I took vitrectomy ports to remove the PFCL because we performed fluid air exchange a bit of endo laser and then remove the PFCL. That's the fluid air exchange happening then. It's very important that uh, the IO is first placed and then the fluid air exchange. So here uh, the fibrin glue was applied and uh, the conjunctival peritomy sites were also closed along after the scleral flaps were closed. So this technique was uh, basically a device by Professor Dr. Amar Agarwal, who's a very good friend of Rajan Sir and most of the panelists here. And uh, we've seen very good results even in long-term follow-up cases. Uh -huh. I have followed up cases for even at least around 10 years. So, this, uh, sorry, five years. So it's very good uh, results that I've seen. So this individual uh, came up with the post-operative visual acuity of uh, 6.9. And uh, very happy at the end of the day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Oscar. Any Thank quick you. question or comments? Can I assist? Or, uh, Orindra? Excellent surgery, sir. Excellent, Excellent surgery. surgery. Very nice. Beautifully managed, and all the steps were so calculated. Movement were there, and I really admire the surgical skill of Dr. Asgar. Really Thank wonderful, wonderful, and uh, it's an excellent surgery. No comments. <laughs> no further comments, I should say. Thank you so much, sir. It means a lot. We're proud of you, Asgar.
for thank that. you so much with all your thank teaching you. and blessings yeah. <laughs> we request next uh, dr sanjeev mohan to introduce dr tarik uh, lakshmi can you show the tare the slide lakshmi stop sharing this one full stop sharing yeah stop sir can you have to share uh, show this right sanjeev are you there श्रीनगर Uh, and uh, is a fellowship in veterinary surgery and laser from Ratna Foundation Ahmedabad. Contact from Delhi. He is reward of make a Hero of India. I coined Trichy 2016 Best Paper Award Asia Pacific 2017 Award for Excellence Asia Pacific Association 2018 Gold Medal I coined Kolkata January 2019. state award for meritorious service 2017 2018 international hero of the world day was in indoor 2019 um, and uh, air marshal bopray award in december 2019 from the uh, opera trauma society of india and best paper in opera trauma all india academic society february 2020 so that is good afternoon everybody uh, rahul rahul number 13 rahul Good afternoon, and sharing a unique uh, surgical. all over the world that is palate ocular trauma and this patient has a palate injury with traumatic cataract vitreous hemorrhage subretinal palate and vitreous hemorrhage we are doing a pars plana 23 gauge th- vitrectomy and first step what we did was to put the three trochars and cannulas right now we are doing the lensectomy and the parameters for the lensectomy as you all know know that the cutting rate is less aspiration is more step by step we remove the cap- anterior capsule posterior capsule and whole of the cortex important thing is just to minimize the amount of cortex left behind the iris otherwise next day it comes to the pupillary area and the next step is the core vitrectomy and the core vitrectomy is very nicely seen once you are seeing that the, we are removing the blood the clear vitreous and the, all what is there in the core and second step is induction of posterior vitreous detachment in all these cases we have been finding difficulty in inducing the pvd probably the uh, cause was that young patient now you can see that the palate is subretinal at in the temporal retina and we are making a small retinotomy there to push up the uh, palate into the anterior uh, into the vitreous cavity we are separating the vitreous scaffold from the retina so that the localized vitreous uh, retinal detachment is there only once we have removed it we remove it by from the past plana we make a conjunctival flap right now we are making a conjunctival flap in the superior limbus cauterizing it so that no blood goes into the vitreous cavity we are using a bipolar cautery so as to minimize the blood going into the vitreous cavity we measure 3.5 mm from the limbus and then with the mvr blade microvitreous retinal blade we make an incision of around 4 mm because the size of the pellets is somewhere around 3.5 and we have to be a little larger than the size of the pellet right now we are making a 4 mm incision to full thickness pars plana and we have introduced a 20 gauge uh, forceps this forceps has been innovated by professor natrajan we just go to the base of the pellet pull it out and now you can see it coming to the pars plana along with little bit of iris plana we are cleaning the palate with the saline and now you can see this tiny dot which creates the havoc 
we are closing the wound with 60 vicryl why to have such thick ropes just to, because we are introducing silicon oil at the end now we revert back to the vitrectomy part we are doing subretinal fluid drainage fluid air exchange and followed by the endo laser right now we are settling the retina we're making the surface dry and we are doing the laser or barrage laser around the retinal tear in the peripheral retina the retina is fully settled nicely attached the view of the vitreous is very clear and at the end we are putting up silicon oil this was a very fortunate patient and we removed silicon oil after six weeks we did a scleral fixated uh, lens and patient has 690. He still comes for follow-up. In between, he had rise in intraocular pressure, which we managed by topical anti-glaucoma drugs. And now patient is doing so well. We have managed till now around 1,700 of the patients with the grace of all and blessing from all with the patronage of Professor Natarajan. Only 23 of them have gone both blind both eyes. The rest of the patients of 1700 are doing so well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Qureshi, and uh, really salute you for your all the great teamwork, and you're a great leader there in the Sri Maharajing uh, Hari Singh. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing is, when the pellet trauma happens, there are hundreds of patients coming into the casualty, and the whole team, they operate from morning to late night, and I think they've done a wonderful meticulous wound repair. And uh, that's good. And I think a wonderful team. And uh, I think I didn't see a single end of the matters. That, uh, and, uh, and thanks for the fact we both are writing the world's largest series of uh, World of the, the Pellet of the Coma. Thank you, Tariq, for joining us. Sir, uh, yes, Dr. Tariq. Sir, I have a question. Sir, I have a question, sir. Welcome, sir. Yes, yes. Sanjeev, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, go ahead with the question. Sir, I have a question. Sir, yes, yes. go ahead, boy. <coughs> sir, uh, in any case, uh, did you find silicon oil is going towards uh, subretinally? So before injecting the silicon oil, we make sure that the retina is fully settled. But in two cases, who had a large retinal tear, the uh, silicon had oil had gone subretinal, and they had to be reoperated for a, a redetachment. We first removed the silicon oil, injected PFCL, settled retina, and reinjected silicon oil. But in this case, there was no subretinal uh, silicon oil migration. Mm -hmm. To prevent that, uh, what are the precautions you should take, sir? Well, precautions are number one. Sir. Firstly, is that the vitreous scaffold has to be clearly clear off. You hmm. should not leave any strand of vitreous in attached to the retina. Hmm. Clear yes. all the vitreous, clear peripheral vitreous, attach the retina, do a proper fluid exchange, and keep the dry surface with the fluid needle, remove all the fluid so that the surface is dry and those so that the interface does not go into the subretinal tissue. Do you okay, find, uh, did you find anything like, uh, suppose the retina, the entry wound in the retina, where yeah. the formula actually lies subretinally, if the retinal okay. wound is very irregular, did okay. you find in such cases the silicon is going subretinally and causing you know, then sometimes uh, you may get the silicon will be coming subconjectively also. That is post-operative complication. One or two patients did have subretinal and subconjectile migration of silicon and they were reoperated and that's not a big issue of removing subretinal silicon oil along with the PFCL yes. and yes. the retina with the second surgery. <laughs> we did have complication. It's not that we had a cakewalk like this, what we have seen. We had the, even the toughest cases where almost 360 degree fibrosis was there, but we managed with multiple surgeries and they are, all of them are doing well. To make one, it, one while removing question. the for, one while removing the foreign body, if you make a cleaner cut at the site of retinal injury, that, I think that will make uh, that will prevent uh, probably the migration of silicon rather than actually disturbing the retina. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Some more question um, was there? Yeah, Dr. Qureshi, I'm sorry, my net had gone, so I couldn't introduce you. Thank you, Dr. Natarajan, for doing that. Uh, you have been, of course, operating so many thousands of cases for pellet injuries. I'm sure you have also encountered some kind of cases where they may not be having any perception of light and uh, probably hypotony as well. So would you still like to go ahead with a hypotony and with no perception of light with a pellet injury? 
See, uh, there were around six patients of palate injuries who had no perception of light. We did give them uh, this uh, IV prednisolone uh, and operated them. And four of them have it's hand movements. There. They have right. hand movements. And even right. if this thysis uh, patient had thysis, we did uh, multiple surgeries. Yeah, yeah. At least we were able to put in place the globe. If they had no vision, but at least the vision. Right. And were you and putting... I would like to say oxygen uh, concentration is very well. Doctor, 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 Doctor Mayhul, can you meet? Can you meet? Uh, any, even if there is a thysical eye, do you normally leave, do you normally leave the silicone oil uh, forever? We don't, uh, we use for those high sky eyes, we use a heavy silicone oil which remains for quite some time till some amount of hypotony is overcome. Right. Thank you, Dr. Gureshi. Thank you for your Thank answers. you. May I get into the discussion? May I get to the discussion, Danati? Yes, yes, Thanasis. Thanasis from uh, Greece. Yes, Thanasis. Well, uh, sorry, first of all, for my miscommunication in the beginning because I'm in my vacation time and it's Sunday. And it's just, I am in this place, just swimming, and I have to be participating. So it's a horrible situation for me. So the next thing is, uh, my, my, my teacher is uh, Professor Nataraja, who when I, I was his fellow in 1995, when he taught me how to remove pellets. So I got two lessons from him. The one is... Uh, that I changed my mind is I, I try never to use the exit side uh, from the sclera. It's too big, it's too bulky, and it's something, it's a lot of traction to the retina. So because I'm a retina surgeon, I have no respect for the lens. Not at all. So I prefer, it doesn't matter what condition of the lens is, I always do lensectomy, I remove the lens, and I take it out, and then I, I prepare, I leave some sulcus to put a sulcus three-piece lens, if the lens is okay. And then I put the lens inside. Well, I have removed that. And uh, this way, we don't have secondary complication from the retina by removing from the sclera. And the first thing, the other thing that I'm doing now, I never use heavy silicone or long-standing silicone now. I can understand the thysis and the softness of the eye. But the silicon I'm using is 5,700 centistokes, which is comparable of leaving it there for a couple of years without having any trouble until now. I don't know if I'm understood, but I'm really happy of being with you all day, all day. And I, I think I'll be back with you at noon when I have my swimming lessons first. Thank you, sir. I, Thank you for your advice. You're welcome. Sorry for my internet connection. Thank you, Tanasis, for the wonderful uh, comments. And I always enjoy, I keep learning from you. And I think more than... My teacher, days. my old teacher. I'm your student, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tanasis. Next is... Uh, Dr. Rish. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tarek, for a wonderful... All the best. All the best. Dr. Purendra, sir. I think it's not that simple. Sir, I will share okay. the screen of Dr. Aishwarya. Yeah, you can share the Aishwarya yes. thing. I will share the screen, sir. Have I said you can introduce Aishwarya? Aishwarya. Sorry? So you can introduce her. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Dr. Devi Aishwarya Das. Uh, you're a consultant for uh, anterior segment, mainly the cataract, cornea, and the refractive surfaces at Dr. Garwal's uh, hospital in Katak. And you're the executive head at the uh, Odisha State Chapter of uh, WS, that is the Women's Ophthalmology Society. I understand that WS is doing extremely well, and I'm very proud of the WS that has been formed in our country. I'd like you to share your screen and go ahead with the talk. Thank you. Uh, and I feel blessed to be, uh, be amongst you all. Uh, so I've been showing two videos. Uh, both are uh, cases of uh, repair of uh, iris defects. Uh, the first uh, I would like is where I uh, manage it with uh, just a single pass port through fibroplasty. 
and the second is where it just doesn't suffice so what message i would like to put across is um, we must be prepared with the best technique but sometimes we must have other uh, techniques uh, uh, in our hand too and when it's not possible to repair the iris entirely we must be prepared with iris segments as well as sometimes uh, an iris i use also so i'm going to start showing my first video it's not coming mm. it's not coming not no no i haven't started sharing not so okay. visible now no no ma'am no not visible no nah. rahul ah yes Mark? come it's yeah come. yeah yeah it's come yeah so you see a uh, iris defect here i have already put in the glue dial here so now what you are left is with the single pass fourth row pupillar plasty so i have an animation also in place so we make two stab incisions opposite to the area where we want the iris to be repaired so this is the proximal incision this is the proximal iris then we pass it into a needle 26 gauge needle this is the distal iris end and then we bring it out through the distal ex excision so now we have essentially five parts to this suture so this is so this is the suture trail so the one outside the proximal incision is part 1 then the second is part 2 then between the proximal and the distal iris is part 3 then distal to distal incision is part 4 and the rest is part 5 so to simplify it we put in a second since key hook and try to bring out the iris from part 2 through the distal incision so this is the area of interest so we drag this portion of the suture through the distal incision and this is where we pass a fourth row i think dr anurag had also demonstrated it what i do generally is i i cut the uh, needle and i just use the suture end to draw the fourth row so what we have is a helical structure and then we draw the two opposite ends diametrically opposite to each other so this is how we achieve the single pass fourth row pupilloplasty and then we cut the suture ends then we tighten the knot and then we cut the suture ends with micro scissors and then to repair the entire iris length we can give n number of uh, such uh, sutures and this is how we achieve it so here it was possible to repair it with just single pass fourth row pupilloplast now is the second video visible no no it started, started yeah right. yeah so this is essentially a larger iris dialysis not started yet here what i would like to show is where just a single pass fourth row pupilloplasty didn't suffice i said a click it click it is not started it's not started no no started no ma'am click on play button yeah click. otherwise close otherwise close and share again okay Yeah. Now is it visible? Yes, yeah, sir. Ma'am, click, ma click on share screen. Sorry. May I play from my end, ma'am? Yes. Uh, no, I have an issue here because I need to adjust. Okay. So now is it visible? You share it first. I've shared it. No, it's not. Okay, Mr. Rahul, can you share it? Rahul, Rahul. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the video name? What is the video name? Just a minute. I think I'm sharing it. Number fourteen. Number fourteen. No, number fourteen. Uh, there are two video of the ma'am. This okay. U cut and SFT. The U cut. The U cut. Okay. 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 Fine. Yeah. This is such a good. A single pass fourth row pupilloplasty didn't suffice, 
so this is what i do then mr rahul can you take it up to 50 seconds just drag up to 50 seconds yeah fine 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 so here i'm just putting the single pass for through people of st and then what i see is a hammer kind of iris so no ways can i repair this with four through people of st so here i use a second technique so i just use the same nine nine nanoproline nine straight needle and then just like i would repair a simple iris dialysis hydrodialysis this is how i do it so two two needles passed at a distance of each other and i make a tie beneath the scleral tunnel so what i would like to say is sometimes one technique may not suffice we must have knowledge of few techniques because all repairs won't be same all repairs won't behave similarly on table and we must be prepared with iris segments and even an ld iols thank you thank you very nice uh, video i have a question to dr ashwarya yes uh, what is the amount of intraocular pressure you need to maintain uh, so that to prevent any form of iris bleeding yeah i this uh, i think if uh, you have a lens in place if you have a lens in place and your piece is intact then your job is simpler you can use visco and do it under visco but if your lens is uh, not in place you don't have an intact piece and you're going for a glue dial then it's important to maintain your intraocular pressure i think you have to but keep what uh, should be the amount around 30 to 35 or more you cannot uh, you need an adequate pressure you cannot uh, major Actually, Pravin, they, uh, when the aerodialysis has already happened, the ciliary body that has been traumatized initially, the vessels have already uh, they have already clogged. Uh, yes. You won't have a fresh bleeding from those vessels. No. Now, when you're suturing the iris, you have to have maintain very... intraocular pressure so that there is no egress of uh, iris, the remaining iris tissue through your wounds. So you have to keep on manipulating your intraocular exactly. pressure. Exactly. So, especially when yeah, so you have to you have to ascertain that there is no fresh trauma or fresh traction at the ciliary body yeah exactly while that trying to suture it so the stress of your remaining iris tissue through the wound so that's important i think i would like to intervene here the basic concept is you need to maintain a intraocular pressure to prevent other complications like uh, expulsive and bleeds and all whatever Pra pravin is saying is true so you can have a infusion cannula in place if you are a vitreous surgery if you are doing or you can have an anti chamber maintainer which can be put on and off depending on so that the adequate pressure is maintained and we do not incite further complications like expulsive and all so in our settings we always maintain a infusion cannula okay and what will be the height of the uh, the bottle height will be around yeah. we maintain the pressure close to 20 to 30 uh, degree yeah what we need to do is and all we uh, have it work on a low iop importance is to maintain certain intraocular fluid so that it does not collapse and lead to further complications so like expulsion mm -hmm. and all yeah an infusion cannula is fine sir but i would be very skeptical using an anterior chamber maintainer in uh, iris repairs because it always it is, makes uh, the yeah. sutures afloat you can't really grab them properly uh, to do whatever you wish to so how do you proceed in such cases where the PC is not there? If, if you are not using uh, AC maintainer, we cannot use viscoelastic in such cases where the PC is absent. For a trocar cannula posteriorly, not an AC maintainer. Not an AC. When PC is intact, the problems are less. When there is no PC, when there is no when there is no intact pc and there is no barrier then it becomes a problem anyways i would go for a trocar cannula not for an ac maintainer uh, uh, was what uh, dr anurag was asking uh, that uh, the, what should be the or uh, dr praveen the height of in, the bottle height should be uh, i think it should not be too much because uh, if it is too distended a glow the chances of uh, iris prolapse through the wounds will be high because whenever you are going inside the the iris will come out and you will have you will further traumatize the iris which you are repairing so it should be not not too high uh, only to maintain the integrity of the globe that is sufficient that and much pressure should be that you can titrate on table 
even i would like to use the trocar cannula on the normal saline stand not on the vitrectomy mm -hmm. when they do the vitrectomy it, the trocar cannula is attached to the normal saline stand so where i we can actually monitor the we can actually regulate the amount of fluid going in through the tubing fortunately now most of the machines are iop mon, uh, maintained so for us we maintain around 20 to 30 we have all alcon systems that is the advantage thank you thank you dr thank you. and uh, next can i ask dr subodhi to introduce the next speaker i think we are supposed uh, to finish by one but uh, we have three more speakers and i hope the audience will not mind it's late lunch Lakshmi, next is Doctor. Yeah. Yeah. No, Lakshmi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Next is Doctor. Doctor Prashant. Doctor Prashant. No, no, Doctor Bhagavat. Bhagavat Nayak. Bhagavat Nayak. Doctor Nayak. Now is Doctor Bhagavat. Next slide, Nayak. sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, Subhuti, sir, should I play, sir? No, 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 it's okay now. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, but sure, but next slide. Hmm. Lakshmi, next slide. So, I have the pleasure of introducing one of my colleagues, Dr. Bhagavat Naik. He is the assistant professor of Arunista Medical Sciences, Bhuvaneshwar. He did his MD from Ames, Delhi. And SR, again, Ames from Delhi. Hyco, surgeon, cataract, glaucoma, and refractive surgery. So he is continuing as assistant professor Ames Bhuvaneshwar now, passing out MD from RP Center. Yes, he had a three years uh, experience under the professor Ramanjit Shavat Shiotai. They were famous um, glaucoma tag, Professor Tanuj Dada and Professor Kokar. He is now engaged in patient care and also teaching programs at Ames Bhuvaneshwar. His research work with more than 30 publications of which to our PubMed. So with these few words, I welcome uh, Dr. Bhagavat Naik to present his case. Thank you. Yes. Like you have to stop sharing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Bhagavat, please. Yeah. Uh, thank yes. you, sir. Sorry. Thank you, sir for your kind, uh, kind words and uh, uh, my uh, good wishes and my pronoun to all the senior faculty here and uh, share your screen yeah yeah I am, okay yeah. i'm sharing 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 just one Now it's sharing, sir. No, no, it's not visible. Rahul ji, there now. Rahul. Rahul, number fifteen. Not coming. No, uh, now it's coming. Uh, now, it's coming, no? Yeah, it's no, from, from it's my is... side. From my side. From, from your 15. side. Uh, okay, just 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 pause. just back back. Doctor Rahul. Mr. Now it's coming. Pause. pause, just pause. Yeah. Dr. Rahul? Yes, sir. I paused, sir. Already paused. I paused from my side. That's visible. Can you see my screen, sir? No, no, yeah. no. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. Visible. Screen is there, but nothing is visible. Ah, now yes. visible? Yeah, just pause, just pause, Dr. Rahul. Yeah. Sir, paused already, sir. Okay, okay. So uh, there is a case, there is a case of total hyphema, and uh, it was it, she presented with us uh, with a, a cow horns injury after four days, and the pressure was 22 millimeter mercury, and uh, we decided to drain the hyphema because uh, there are some indications to drain the hyphema if there is a total hyphema for four days or there is. Uh, pressure of more than 50 millimeter mercury for uh, 
eight days or if there is a uh, that means a sickling cell patient even a low pressure like 22 uh, press iop also we can drain so otherwise if the cornea is staining we can drain the uh, hypema so we decided to uh, uh, drain the hypema in this case and after that we saw uh, we discharged the patient but after three months the patient came with the uh, secondary glaucoma and on the di diagnosis we saw there was a more than 270 degree angle recession. So we decided to do trabeculatum with mite machines in the and I will share the video. But I want to uh, say that the angle recession glaucoma is a misnomer. It is not the angle recession uh, uh, lead to the glaucoma. There are some other causes like uh, there is concussional injury leading to fibrosis of the trabecular meswork or there are, the, there are some host cells uh, blocking the trabecular meswork or inflammations or cyanicia all lead to the glaucoma. So I want to, uh, now uh, Rahul, uh, just play the video. Yeah. So uh, there was a total hyphema like this in presentation. And uh, after hyphema drainage with biomanual irrigation, aspiration, and clot removal, again, the first post of day, there was a rebreeding. So we started with oral tranexamic acid, 500 milligram BD. After three days, hyphema got cleared. And after five days, the patient was discharged with 14, 14 millimeter of mercury and only some just blood And after three months came with not uh, reducing less than 40 millimeter of mercury. And there was more than 270 degree of uh, angle resistance. So I uh, decided to do trabeculotomy. And this was a furnished based flop. After doing the conjunctive peritomy, you can see there is a 360 degree circumcillary congestion and the corneal edematous. You can see uh, due to high IOP, uh, nearly about 40 pressure was not controlling even after monitor pressure was coming to 30 like that. So that is a quadrangular flap, 4 into 4 millimeter size. And, uh, and also I put the subscleral uh, metamycin for 1 minute, 0.04% and my ostium is 2 into 1 millimeter size and after the aridotomy I am putting with the two uh, angle fluff suture with 10 zero monofilament and island and so we have to take care of the conjunctiva not to engage in the suture then after putting the two religiable suture this is Wilson's technique from the corneal end then taking the fluff then again to the cornea and there is a knot on the cornea and you have to bury it there are other eligible uh, suture technique also, but I am comfortable with this. And it is, I, so after that, uh, I, I am putting just one uh, lateral side flap suture because it was inverted. Uh, so the flap suture should be adequate, not too much tight or loose. And I was also putting one called allogen implant, six into two millimeter size, to just double secret the, to preventing the fibrosis and conjectival closure was with two wing sutures with angio nylon. Monofilament nylon, I usually put that for wing suture to reduce the retraction. And the front leaf was closed with two mattress suture with tangier monofilament nylon. And this is a tangier monofilament nylon suture. And the side side leaf of the wound was uh, closed with eight zero round body vicrin to secure the uh, tight closure of the wound. Other side also with eight zero round body vicrin and the subcons uh, genta deca not been given. I was first post of the nine millimeter mercury with uh, good uh, anterior chamber depth, but after seven days it came to the shallow due to mild uh, attachment. And with the medication with steroid, it came to the uh, good uh, IOP control with no CD. So after six months, the patient was having 10 millimeter mercury with uh, no CD. And there was mild vitreous hemorrhages uh, in, uh, uh, in the posterior segment. Uh, we did ultrasound before doing the surgery and that was reserved after three months also. So uh, and the posterior pole, there was a macula, some mild thinning was there and was cataract. But our main aim was to control the pressure which was uh, very good with 10 millimeter mercury even after six months till now with good blev architecture and uh, uh, we may plan cutter surgery later.
thank you for my uh, listening for my presentation and none, any question i can take i am audible sir so sir yes yes yeah. thank yeah. you yeah. mukherjee sir you want to comment Uh, Dr. Mukherjee, sir, are you commenting? Well, you nicely, nicely did uh, many cases and uh, everything done at a proper time, which is required. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sir Naik and Dr. Subhati. Next, can we ask Dr. Purendra Basin to introduce our uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Prashant Dhankule? Yes, sir. Can you share the screen, sir? Can you please share the screen? Dr. Prashant is a good friend of mine, and uh, I really like him. And people always look at his face. It's so innocent looking and um, ever young. For last 10 years, I am seeing that he has not changed a, a bit. And um, he is a wonderful, very prolific vitreo retinal surgeon, having a Sarakshi Netrale at Nagpur. He has uh, earned uh, orations of uh, NSS uh, I Institute Retina Substratum Oration by all Gujarat Ophthalmic Society in 2019. And he has uh, done an oration at, uh, of uh, Dr. Anjana Saikia Memorial Oration by Assam Ophthalmological Society again in 2019. He has achieved uh, Best Video Award of Asia Pacific Ocular Trauma Society Double Trouble Perforating Injury with Intraocular Foreign Body, Best Paper, Anand Saxena Gold Medal, Chhattisgarh Ophthalmic Society, Best Video Award, World Congress of Ocular Trauma 2019. Current positions, he is a Joint Treasurer of Vitae Retina Society of India, Treasurer of our Ocular Trauma Society of India, Past ARC Member, West Zone All India Ophthalmic Society, Past Chairman Scientific Committee Vidarbha Ophthalmic Society, Past President Maharashtra of Thelmic Society, Past President Vidarbha of Thelmic Society. I wish him good luck for his presentation. He is a master uh, vitreo retina surgeon and a beautiful human being. I really appreciate his working. Welcome, Dr. Prashant. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. Now? Is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh. So I would be speaking, my uh, next 12 minutes, I would be speaking about traumatic macular hole. Uh, so trauma is the second most common cause for macular hole. The first cause being naturally the age. The incidence in a closed globe injury is 1.4%, while with the open globe injury, it is 0.015%. The specialities or peculiarities of a traumatic macular hole is that it is more commonly seen in younger patients naturally because trauma is more common in young. It's more common in males naturally because males are more trauma prone. And these traumatic macular holes have poor visual acuity at presentation compared to age-related macular holes. And there is no correlation between visual acuity and the size of traumatic macular hole noted on an OCT. And most importantly, spontaneous closure of a macular hole is not uncommon. Important is just macular hole is also associated with associated conditions like a commoshi retini or a Berlin sedima. You can have a choroidal tear, you can have a subretinal hemorrhage, or you can have a peripheral subclinical retinal detachment because of a horseshoe tear along with a full thickness macular hole. And therefore is the importance of doing a complete indirect ophthalmoscopy and just not going by seeing a OCT picture and you can see many of these findings which might need concomitant management while you are tackling a macular hole. Mechanisms, it can be a counter coup mechanism because of the when there is a decompression, there is a traction on the posterior pore. This is one of the mechanisms which has been proposed by this group while it, acute dehiscence of fovea can lead to immediate visual loss which is a rare phenomenon. And this is the second way how a macular hole can create because of a blunt injury. Clinically, if you see this macular holes are more elliptical in shape, that is they are horizontally more of a lot bigger than this. Other thing is they are also associated with 
associated trauma related picture in the retinal pigment epithelium you can have it optic nerve pallor you can have a chorea retinal atrophy here oct findings are also characteristics here they have a larger basal diameter they have a larger basal area here and retinal thickness is much lower at the edge they might have srf and intraretinal cyst and pvd is unlikely and if pvd is unlikely and if it is a smaller hole these patients tend to have spontaneous closure so as i said spontaneous closure in a full thickness macular hole happens in 10 to 40% of the patient and it can happen as early as 2 weeks and it can happen as late as <clears throat> and therefore and it is more commonly seen in a younger age group that is in children where 50% of them can have a small so what are the oct predictors which tell that we should not operate and wait for the spontaneous closure one is smaller holes less than 250 or uh, uh, microns absence of pvd and absence of intraretinal cyst so if you see these three features on an oct in a case of a traumatic macular hole it would be prudent enough for you to postpone the surgery and how does the spontaneous closure happens because of the proliferation of glial cells or rp cells from the whole edge or stimulation of astrocyte migration or because of formation of contractile epiretinal membrane so naturally what is the procedure yes the only way to close it surgically is vitrectomy and when should you do it preferably wait for 3 to 6 months especially so in younger patients smaller holes good visual acuity and where pvd is absent early vitrectomy is recommended only if you see a large traumatic macular hole or in a pediatric age age group where amblyopia can be a reason where you can go in for early vitrectomy and what do we do as a vitreo retinal surgeons we do vitrectomy with internal lamp limiting membrane peel with or without inverted flap and along with a gas tamponade so this is case 1 this is a pre op oct of this particular patient and you can see after completing the vitrectomy we need to stain the ilm after having removed all the membranes this is a ilm peel technique which is being done and uh, you can have petechial hemorrhages while you are pinching or peeling the membrane and it suggests that you are uh, completed the peel over there that region and this petechial hemorrhages spontaneously close and you don't need to do any cautery in this most important region so this i am trying an inverted flap technique where the inter uh, ilm is peeled from all the areas and then it is stuffed into the macular hole we prefer to extend the peel up to the arcades and i extended the thing and at the last i would be uh, putting the thing everything is stuffed into the hole and then a fluid gas exchange is done this is the post op oct of a success successful closure of the hole this is a case 2 because of a cataract you can see the quality of oct is not good and this is a case where i am trying to do a again an ilm peel for a traumatic macular hole after staining the hole we are again trying to peel the internal limiting membrane the thing which we learn from this case, particular case is that i am trying to stuff the hole under the fluid and in this case while i am handling it there is a loss of the flap and uh, yes so do we need a inverted flap in every case in spite of losing the flap means i could not complete it simple old technique of from the island peel was done and you can see the closure of the hole so you don't do not need to do peeling inverted flap flap technique in all the cases case 3 this is one of the largest macular holes i have operated you can see such a big it is more than 1500 to 2000 micron and this is the case this is a case of a traumatic macular hole and you can see up uh, there is a traumatic chorioretinal atrophy and you can see the pallor of the disc so again an inverted flap technique and here what we do differently is that after getting the flaps fully peeling the flap and bringing it close to the posterior pole we use the pf cell to stabilize and here i have put a pf cell bubble and under the pf cell bubble i am uh, uh, stuffing the whole ilm into the flap and after i have stuffed the ilm into the hole last we do remove the pf cell and do replace the vitreous cavity with the help of a air and this is the post operative that was such a large hole it has been reduced to almost 500 microns type 1 type uh, type 2 type of a closure which we could achieve now this is a case of a traumatic macular hole along with a rd this is a old retinal detachment with a pvr 
what we need to learn from these cases is that simple ILM peeling is not going to help and the contributing factor to the development of macular hole can be peripheral membranes like this. And so peeling this membrane, relieving the peripheral traction is an equally important part. And if you see, as I complete the peripheral traction liberation, you can see in spite of ILM peel, the hole has collapsed on its own. So ILM is an essential step in these cases, but relief of peripheral traction in a macular hole associated with retinal detachment is equally important. And this is last case of my series. This is a patient. This is important in a blunt trauma, in a case of a trauma. This have associated comorbidities like a iridodialysis. You can have a subluxation of a lens. So this is a young patient with a macular hole with a traumatic subluxated cataract. And you can see here we need to do simultaneous management of multiple things. So I plan for a cataract surgery over here. Um, see, um, yes, I have created a flap over there and side ports over here. Now I'm trying to create a capsular excess, capsular excess in a subluxated small um, uh, thing. We need to be careful with it. And after I do that, hydro dissection is doing that. You can see a phaco, phaco aspiration was all that was needed. It was a very soft cataract. And I could see that there is some sense uh, of vitreous over here. So I am now putting a vitreous cutter and doing an anterior vitrectomy through the limbal root in the area of subluxation. After completing the vitreous removal from this area, I'm proceeding with my further phaco procedure. And uh, after that, because the bag was not very stable, I'm putting a CTR over here. And after stabilizing the bag, here is what we do. After having put a CTR, I'm putting a three-piece lens in the bag. And after putting the lens, we go ahead with the vitreous surgery. After doing a vitrectomy, we need to stain the ILM. And after staining the ILM, again, the same inverted flap technique is being done. And you can see uh, ILM into it. Air exchange was done. And that was the end of the procedure. And this is a post-operative OCT. So to conclude, you should remember that trauma is the second most common cause for development of macular bone. They usually have poorer visual acuity because of associated injuries. Spontaneous closure in young in small holes is not uncommon. It can happen as high as 40 to 60 percent of the patients. And therefore, it is preferable to delay surgery for three to six months in the wait for uh, spontaneous closure. And in the patients who have larger macular who are not using choices, vitrectomy with ILMP with some tamponade. Uh, and that can take care anatomically. Thank you. Great, uh, great presentation, Prashant, on a macular hole. I think you showed a variety of different types of large holes and the different type of holes. Santosh, do you have any? Yes. See, uh, great presentation. Thank you, Santosh. Uh, I have two questions. One is uh, how early and how late uh, you you have to uh, operate in traumatic macular holes though you have told us the points but uh, uh, how late you can wait and secondly do you uh, perform uh, inverted flap techniques in all uh, cases of uh, traumatic macular hole surgery and uh, why See, the actual thing is, in a case of a trauma, we need to also, we usually do not operate before two to three months unless it is too large a hole because that gives an opportunity for the body which has undergone, a, means the eye which has received a trauma, it takes time for it to resolve on its own. So the inflammation and all will take about four to six weeks for it to resolve. By that time, if there are some angle decisions and other comorbidities that can be properly and tackled, then... As I said, there are OCT predictors which tell you which are likely to go into closure, spontaneous closure. A hole which is less than 300-400 microns, which has a PVD which is attached to its edges. These are the edges and also are having a relatively good RP. In these cases, we see spontaneous closure. And so, we prefer to wait at least three months in such cases. If it is associated with a comorbidity in the form of subluxation of a lens or if he's having a, uh, some uh, vitreous hemorrhage or it, it, in that case, 
I think I answered that, Santosh. No, you see, visual outcome uh, usually most of the times does not correlate with the anatomical closure of the hole in traumatic cases. So yes. in these, those... Right. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Because it is the associated, the injury does not only create a trauma or a hole in the macular area. The chorioretinal area, the optic nerves receive some form of traumatic neuropathy, some form of chorioretinal atrophy. And that is the precise reason why these patients do not improve in spite of a good anatomical closure. Because whatever is visible to your eyes, that is what the trauma you can see or a chorioretinal atrophy. But we need to understand a blunt injury which can cause a trauma has to have some impact on the chorioretinal tissues and the optic nerve which is adjacent to it. Nageshwara Rao? Nageshwara? Yes, sir. You want to say something? No, the, the nicely he has uh, said and showed the, his videos. But the thing is actually what uh, the discussion was going and actually the reason, the outcome of outcome of this surgery is traumatic macular holes, not good what you expect actually. Anatomically, you may close these holes, but uh, functionally they may not be so good. But my question is actually while taking into consideration the surgery in the traumatic holes, what are the factors you consider actually? Apart from this uh, OCT, because nowadays it has come, but Sar will tell Professor Natarajan. Earlier, what you used to do, sir? Prashant, you got the question? I think question is for you. What you would do without a OCT about deciding for surgery in the era pre-OCT? <laughs> what you used to do? No, actually, that time there was no ILM peeling. And plus, I think uh, I think Wendell uh, Wendell was the one first who did the vitrectomy in uh, I think in ninety one, and then later he came and presented in uh, our Vitrectomy Society of India one of the earliest uh, nephrological operation. So we used to do the vitrectomy, and as he said, vitrectomy two direct exchange and no OCT. I mean, we could see the macular hole uh, only with a ninety D or a seventy eight D in the slit trap, and then operate. Then uh, did you... I was I was the one first introduced OCT in India in uh, 2000 and uh, so I think after that we used OCT and I remember still that time nobody had OCT and uh, Badinath asked me what will you do with OCT now the question is what will you do without OCT <laughs> so how what are the changes actually you have, uh, you have seen actually uh, from pre OCT era to OCT era what are the changes you observed in traumatic no, I think one is, one is uh, if you have seen particularly in diabetic uh, retinopathy or in, even in vitreo macular attraction, we were probably not knowing the cost for the loss of vision without OCT. And now with the OCT, you can even decide on diabetic uh, uh, attractions where whether it's pulling the fovea or not, and then uh, with the macular attraction, whether to operate or not. Because sometimes they only send OCT, the patients, and ask for what to do. So I tell them, we don't operate on the report. So I think we need vision, the history, and the diagnosis. And with OCT, I think it's a, a definitely uh, helps to take a excellent Pre surgical decision. Yes, sir, no. in, in, term, in, in cases of uh, traumatic macular holes, I'm telling you. Yes. Is there any remarkable changes you, you are getting with the OCT evaluation? Or the... No, I, at least the, uh, the uh, what do you call the whether the functional uh, layers of uh, retina are, uh, there are intact or not, or whether the atrophy, you can see it in the, you, know, you can see it clinically also, but clinically OCT also helps. you can see. Yes, that's yeah. correct. Yes. No, important that is what my question. Nageshwar sir, what I feel is pre-OCT, we could not convince the patient the need of the surgery. Now the uh, you really can show across him that you have done your job well. Second thing is in a pre-OCT era, we as a vitreoretinal surgeons were not that aggressive because the supporting vitreoretinal surg uh, surgical techniques were also not that fine where we thought about doing vitreoretinal procedures for macular uh, uh, surg uh, diseases. So in those days, uh, macula was a very, uh, I still remember when I did my fellowship in 94, macula was a, uh, you know, not into consideration into our indications of pituitary surgeries way back in 94 when I was in Shankanetra lab. Very rarely, very rare. Yeah. So and today, yeah. So well, today, 90, see the OCT, before yeah. 90, it was really immature can say the immature is surgery, pituitary surgery. So I still remember today my list of uh, if I have eight to ten procedures, 
four to five are macular procedures. While in ninety four, ninety five, when ten was the least, uh, if if there was a least, there would not be even a single case of macular procedure. So this is because our as a vitreo retinal surgeon, the techniques have improved, understanding of disease has improved. and the instrumentation has improved that we now we see 50% of our ot list in a retina surgery is macular procedures good yes so alok yeah, next i think we have come to the last part of the uh, session uh, so, uh, could i please have the slide yes and uh, alok so i said i want to show you uh, you gave me the slide <laughs> Uh, and actually the tie i'm wearing it is all nation tie as well <laughs> yes i can see that yeah yeah okay i i feel uh, totally privileged and honored to to the most important job of the day um that i get a chance to introduce uh professor dr s natarajan who is chairman and managing director of aditya jyot i hospital president uh, of the organized medicine academy guild immediate past president of all india ophthalmological society and secretary general of global eye genetics consortium uh, board of trustees international council of ophthalmology president Ap uh, aptos sn alumni immediate past president of otsi and board member of iwc isot he is uh, padma shri awardee those people if for the international audience i would like to say that padma shri is one of the top uh honors of of india where president of india awards this and it's a very honorable uh award and professor natarajan has received that and he's renowned for his vitreo retinal as a vitreo retinal surgeon in and is the third generation of ophthalmologist and was born in madurai tamil nadu 36 years experience performed over 60000 exclusive vitreous and retinal surgeries 200 complicated vr surgeries on palate injuries patients and has trained 68 vitreo retinal surgeons across the globe 1500 invited guest lectures which are highest in the uh, number in the world conducted 61 instruction courses 116 public publications in journals written two books seven chapters in books live surgeries in 21 and video presentation is 100 recipient of several international awards for his exemplary work in the medical field of ophthalmology uh, including charter inductee in the retina hall of fame gusi peace prize philippines man of the millennium of ophthalmology award distinguished service award and many more establish a ngo aditya jyot foundation for twinkling little eyes and screened 70000 uh, diabetic retinopathy patients and 60000 children uh, through door to door campaign covered over uh, 200000 uh, households and over 1 million people in slums and performed over 5000 free surgeries acquired guinness world record for performing most diabetic eye in in 2009 and most importantly Uh, on personal level i would like to say that he's a great ophthalmologist he's a great researcher great friend great visionary and he's a, a great humanitarian and truly a karmveer he's a man of action and i must say that he's you know according to the hindu vedas there's something called mani he's like a he's got a midas touch anyone who who he touches it he turns him into gold he's a great man i'll introduce professor dr s natarajan thank you so much and i i should take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, subhudi and nageshwar rao oh, and sos 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 needs your touch very much sir thank you very much and uh, thanks a lot for uh, uh, having me uh, give me the opportunity i think uh, they asked me to just do a webinar and i made it uh, <laughs> right. so i'm i'm doing my shortest presentation of the whole day this is a post road traffic accident the close frontal retinal detachment and a supracorneal hemorrhage refer operated first in a another hospital and then they told the patient nothing can be done okay if you want you can take an opinion from either of me or elder prasad or all the student and the patient came to me so here is a 34 year male presented with a 
close frontal lateral detachment, the supracoral hemorrhage following road traffic accidents. I did a bimanual traction, including the. And here I'm seeing, you can see after doing the vitrectomy, you can see the total uh, retinal detachment and the temporal retina was totally incarcerated to the uh, nasal side and it, it is like a totally uh, closed uh, funnel and I'm removing the subretinal bands from around the uh, behind the retina and then I used uh, in the, the channel elimination and separated the two holes to wheels of the retina and then Use peripheral carbon liquid, and you can see that my totally unfolded. And I used peripheral carbon liquid, and while operating, and I had to re release all the uh, incarceration in the temporal side, nasal side. And another thing asked, Are you going to abandon? And I said, No, I want to keep trying. And I used the candle illumination, opened up the uh, both uh, parts of the retina which was closed, and then I, you can see uh, at the end of the surgery. There was a total corneal wound was there, which was originally repaired, and this is a pre-op picture. And then post-op, we had the corneal suture and the attached retina. And then silicon oil was there. And these are, I think, Sanjeev Mohan was asking, in some of the eyes like this, you may not be able to remove the eye. So thank you very much. This was a complicated PVR I wanted to show. I had one more case, but I'm not showing because I think already we are 137. But I think. What I wanted to say is, in, in, in only in case, case of trauma, even if there's no PL, and I think I, I think that Tariq also mentioned that even if it is almost like looking like pre testicle and everything is well, looks like no hope. And I think in the, I put myself in the patient's shoes and sometimes patients say, try as though you can get some vision. Don't, don't try as though nothing will come. So I think with that, I did uh, several uh, tertiary care, uh, like right, right from uh, ocular trauma from Kashmir to road traffic accident to bullet injury. Dr. Pariha mentioned yesterday about the uh, IPKF thing in 1987. I was operating that time in uh, Chennai, in Shankarnath, Australia. And also post-1984 uh, uh, Operation Blue Star, that is Vendranwala uh, in uh, the Golden Temple. So I think uh, I've seen multiple, and then also uh, cases from any catastrophe like that. And I think the only thing is, Simple will be to prevent injuries, and if it happens, do the best. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, sir. And I think uh, we are almost 1.38, and we are yeah. 38 minutes late. But, uh, you know, and thanks to all the speakers. Thanks, Dr. Uh, especially Dr. Samir Sachi, Dr. Subhuti. And I think it's a great learning. I think uh, the pot puri was really good because uh, otherwise we are stuck to retina or something. Uh, some people are stuck mm -hmm. to cataract. I think we had a variety of canalicular cataract, cornea, then uh, lens, iris. I think um, almost all layers of the eye we had all more surgical oriented and we, uh, we wanted that way videos. And still we'll go and have uh, some more other parts of the world who will be joining us right from, I think yeah. we, we have a speaker from uh, Morocco and I think. This time we had from countries where other other uh, so far they have not taken part in this webinar in India from India. So I think thanks for the opportunity and I'm happy entire Oculotroma Society of India is here. And I think I wanted to compliment uh, Orissa said because generally I've seen many times I've attended their uh, I think last year I think uh, on yes. I was invited a few years back I think I've come for CME and there was always a trauma session even in the Orissa State uh, of Salmic Society. And Dr. Mukherjee, even when he was the vice president, and now as the president, and he is promoting uh, the Oglatoma Society sessions in all uh, uh, state conferences, I'm sure I will be happy that uh, I made this state conference into an international webinar. Dr. Mukherjee, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It is because of your help and assistance we could be able to perform like this. And this is an unconventional way of discussing all types of ocular trauma, sir. And many things, small small things, we could be able to learn from this. I think it is very useful for all of us. Thank you very much. And we need your cooperation in future also. And I also hope that the afternoon session will be also equally interesting and will be also helpful to all of us. You forgot Thank to you. mention Boy Pariguda, Dr. Natarajan. You forgot. Yes, <laughs> my grandfather worked there in Orissa. That's right. He worked in Madras Presidency in 1930. 
I think my father learned. Uh, you were uh, 30, 37, I think 35, 37. Because my father was, he said, eight, nine years. He learned uh, the cycle riding as well as the car <laughs> from his driver at that time. And the Madras presidency extended from Kanyakumari to Orissa. Yeah, yeah. So he was a common servant at that time. And glad. thank you. Thanks for reminding. And, and that is the district of Dr. Subudhi. So I, I thank all the speakers from Orissa, from all parts of the world. And I think uh, now I, uh, anyway, Orissa is known for Konarak and Puri. And now for Aklatrum also. Thank you. And Dr. Alok, thanks for thank you. Uh, thank joining you. us down thank under. You. From Australia to uh, northern, northern part of uh, the world, we have people today. Alok, uh, you can give the last comment and then we, we will close the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Natarajan. And thank you, uh, Dr. Subudhi. Thank you, Dr. Putnayak, Dr. Mukherjee, and all the great speakers. It's, it's just been a great, uh, you know, potpourri and a lot of, you know, what do you call a treat uh, in terms of, because I'm, I'm a, not a, a trauma surgeon. I'm a general ophthalmologist uh, dealing with everything for a huge area and uh, uh, involved with the college as well. So it just is a great learning experience. And the level of, uh, uh, you know, uh, details and the surgery which we have seen and the understanding has been just amazing. Thank you very much for giving an opportunity for me to join you. Yes. Uh, I just I would like to tell uh, that every this year of Apollo Trauma Society is celebrating the Silver Jubilee of the uh, society. Yeah. Every month we are having one symposium uh, from the Ocular Trauma Society in the form of international and combination with the national faculty. Next, uh, we have already done two uh, this symposia. The next symposia is on 22nd of August, which is a very interesting uh, topic. That is, uh, we are going to take up the domestic uh, injuries along with the uh, this. Um, Sports injuries that will be on the 22nd of August. Similarly, subsequently, we will have furthermore uh, other uh, symposia and quiz competition. Thank you so much. And, uh, I will, I will uh, thank uh, NTAR for uh, supporting, and I think we had uh, more than 9,000 uh, viewers in Facebook. 580. 9,900. 9,900. 9,949 totally. Weblink. Uh, 291 and YouTube 582 and Facebook 9076. So thanks a lot. I think I'm happy that uh, we are all learning through the uh, difficult days. But I still, I think uh, with all the corona, I think we have learned more and uh, maybe we will all meet physically. Thank you very much and thanks and Todd for the everything. And, uh, 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 thank you, mentioned that there's some difficulty in the internet part. I think sir, that may be in the individual area, but uh, in spite of little hitches, thanks and Todd. And especially my program manager, Lakshmi, Udma Lakshmi for us, for yes. me. And, uh, <laughs> thank you. And today being a Sunday is a belongs to Sun God. Thanks to uh, Adit Bhagavan. That is uh, sir, now on Facebook, 11,800, sir. Oh, great. Oh, great. Okay, great. Very good. Really nice. Thank you. I think really wonderful. Dr. Natarajan, really wonderful symposium. And we are really delighted to have intercontinental, first intercontinental. I think from all the continents, you have added uh, speakers. Really appreciable. Yes. And for yes. your energy, three yes. cheers. Yes. <laughs> you. See you at uh, yes. again, again, things will be open at 4 o'clock. And so, 5 o'clock is our session. And I will request everybody to keep up the time. I think yes, yes, a yes. Lot, lot of discussions, we learned a lot. Uh, and it was very nice. And that's why I also... I know Dr. Mukherjee and, and Dr. Sabe Sachi mentioned it's a proof that we are delayed. And I saw that. But I think willfully, I'm happy everybody is here. And especially Dr. Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee, very nice to have you till the end. Uh, really, thanks for your contribution and comp uh, the, uh, in, in, in the scientific program. Thank you, sir. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we'll meet at four thirty. You have a voice like Amitabh Bachchan. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Just keep it up. Boys and height, height, and height also. Okay, no, I know, but it's good. I mean, it's like a, I'm, I'm in addition to all the scientific uh, deliberation you have done, your comments. And uh, so one question, I think, uh, I know Santosh was asking, but probably it's a little late. Your line may be defective. 
you are wrong but you are very defective ah asgar is there from uganda thank you asgar